We are your home theater and AV questions answered. This is AV Rant. Want your home theater or AV question answered by Tom and Rob? Send it to question at avrant.com. Welcome to another edition of AV Rant. I'm Tom Andre, and I'm here with... Rob H. This is AV Rant. It's your home theater and AV questions answered. And uh, yeah, we're back to our normal recording time for once this week. We'll see if that continues, but uh, here we are. It's good. Uh, did you watch any of the Oscars? I, I did not. I just read the results. No, and I didn't read the results either. Okay. <laughs> so, I'm useless. Do you care about I, spoilers? Uh... Of who won? Uh, from, from Oscars? From the Oscars? No. No, I don't care about Oscars. <laughs> All right. Well, Parasite won. Everybody was happy about that. They're like, hey, a movie that actually wasn't made in Hollywood and is not in English actually won Best Picture. So, cool. good for What's them. The, uh, I, I've heard good things about that movie, mm-hmm. but I don't know anything about it. I'm kind of keeping it that way. But would I like it? Is it horror? It sounds horror. I, I haven't horror? seen it, um, so I'm not sure. But I love the director's last two. Well, not last two, but the two most well-known movies that he did, which was The Host and... Um, oh, it's a Korean guy. Yeah, and Snowpiercer. He did those two movies. I like both those two. Yeah. He did some other ones I yes, didn't like yeah. as much, yeah. if I remember correctly. Those were the two that Snow- I know, though. So Snowpiercer was great, and Host was okay. Uh, there was, I enjoyed I, it. I think for my... I guess there was a couple of cultural things, I think, that were happening in that movie that sure. I didn't quite get. But uh, I, I kind of like forgave it that and mm-hmm. just enjoyed the parts that i enjoyed i did really like the fact that the sister was a champion olympic archer yes it's like and yeah, i man. love that she was Let's... all slow and they called her turtle that was, that was <laughs> very very just... endearing <laughs> if you haven't seen that that's it's a it's a, it's a worthwhile watch it, it's yeah. been up on netflix from here and there so. and i'm sure people will find yeah. it now now that parasite has won and uh, the director also won best director and he was very lovely his his reactions have been uh gifed all over online and yes i still say gift because i'm of that generation when gifs came out and we called them gifs not gifts uh so yeah come at me go ahead and at me when bro did... oh, wait i thought that was gifts wait who did they i thought they said they definitively said it was gif right the creators did yeah yes but i've always called it gif yeah which i mean it does stand for graphics is what the g stands for so i don't really have that big of a problem with people saying gif but i just got used to saying gif when they first came out and i've stuck with it so there it is (laughs) old dog That's really not a fight I'm willing to have. Exactly. All right. <laughs> this is AV Rant, the podcast that answers your home theater and AV questions. Get your questions answered. All you have to do is ask. You ask by emailing us at question at avrant.com. You go to avrant.com and leave us. Did I say something wrong? I feel like I said something wrong already. <laughs> Just go to avrant.com. Leave us a comment there. <laughs> Facebook.com slash avrantpodcast. Uh, let me see. Face, I already said Facebook. YouTube.com slash avrant mm-hmm. where you can watch and not comment on our videos because youtube sorry <laughs> don't i don't know what to say about the most isley of the of the internet but that's what it is <laughs> well i guess that's really not i guess if it's most isley then then what is uh what is like our you know 4chan and 8chan mm. and all that stuff it's got it's got to be worse i don't know what those would be called the trash compactor i guess i don't know <laughs> it's sticking with the star wars theme there uh if you want to contact us directly, it's Rob at AVRant.com. His Twitter is at First Reflect. I'm Tom at AVRant.com. My Twitter is at AVRant underscore Tom. I just rolled out of bed. I overslept. I couldn't sleep last uh-huh. night. And then, you know, this morning I was kind of puttering around. I was like, I'll just lay up back down for a second. My watch went off and told me it was 730. I'm like, I'm not giving up at 730 for this podcast. <laughs> It's not happening. I don't know what's then, happening with your video feed in my recording because Skype is working fine. I'm seeing you yeah. fine. I, if I go to your feed in OBS, it's fine, and yet you don't show up beside me. I don't know what's going on. Ugh, oh, well. OBS. We'll figure it out. Or not. <laughs> Hopefully. Whatever. I could be the logo. This you year. could this, be. This, it's this, not this your day. fault. You did nothing wrong. I don't know what's going on. It's so strange. Yes. Yeah, very strange. So I'm just a little discombobulated. Let this coffee kick in, and then I'll hopefully start talking right All again. right. We want to thank our listeners of the week, as we always do. To become a listener of the week, you support the podcast in some way. One of the ways you can do that is going to avrant.com and clicking on the Buy Us a Cup of Coffee link. That sends you to a PayPal donation site where PayPal will process your information or your credit card if you do not have a PayPal account, which is fine. Stay anonymous. 
And we want to thank uh, Ezekiel for doing that in the last week. So thank you very much, Ezekiel. Yeah, Ezekiel, thank you so much for that PayPal donation. It's appreciated. I like the name of Ezekiel. I do too. They get a bad rap in movies, though. <laughs> Ezekiel's always like the the tall, blonde, super racist one. You oh, know? or or like uh, or uh, the tall blonde. They're always tall and blonde. Tall blonde, you know, uh, Amish guy who doesn't understand technology. You know, they don't get the best of raps in movies. I don't think they're well represented. But Ezekiel, I think, is a cool name. Hmm. Uh, Patreon. We don't think our pa- uh, 106 Patreon uh, patrons over at Patreon.com, including Dan. Uh, so Patreon is a service where you, it's a monthly subscription service. You subscribe to the content creators of your choice. It can be more than one. And you give them, you assign a some dollar amount that you want to give them every month, and Patreon does that for you. So we want to thank our 106 patrons, including our Patreon, patron Dan. That's right. Uh, Patreon.com slash AV Rant Podcast. If you would like to sign up for an automatic monthly donation, a voluntary subscription, you can think of it. And Dan, thank you for being one of our 106 patrons. If you're like, hey, I'm a patron. They never mentioned me. You have to email us and tell us that you're a patron. That's right. Just Say, tell hey, us. Just, me, just mention it. It's just, I, I, I just figured it was going to be, it's an audio podcast. We're not going to mention, can't mention everybody by name every week. And uh, if it was a video podcast, I would just, we just put all the names up there every time we did a video. But <laughs> no, we wouldn't. Dude, I'm not committing to that. Somebody's going well, to ask that's what to I'm do saying. I'm saying I, I, it's not a video podcast. You know, <laughs> it's, it, it's not a video series. You know, the videos are, uh... are, the only reason we do the YouTube videos is because we talk on the internet and there has yeah we have to talk to each other somehow anyway so might as well record it but now it's causing me stress because i can't get your video to come back inside of obs don't worry about it (laughs) if you can't support us financially or don't want to i understand both uh points of view but you can always do something to uh to support the podcast just let us know what you did and we will mention to you. So Victor talked us up to Blue Jeans Cable. I'm assuming he bought something. He might not have. He might have just called him and said, hey, if you're great, click. <laughs> Listen to the week. I think Listen he bought week. something. But Victor, thank you for talking us up to Blue Jeans. Andrew, in addition to having offered the prize for our 100 Patreon uh, draw, Andrew says he could hang a home theater by AV Rent sign as almost everything in his theater it ha- now was one of our recommendations. <laughs> so, yes, yeah, we're going to continue to thank Andrew for being part of this. Uh, part of that 100 Patreon draw. And uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, I could too. <laughs> Rob could too, just about. Oh, yes. So uh, he, let me see, what did, he say? what did Andrew have? He's got a Denon X3600H and he told Denon about it. He got mm-hmm. an NVIDIA Shield Pro 2019. He told NVIDIA about it. He, an LG B9 OLED and he told LG Canada, who started following Rob on Twitter afterwards. That's right. So props. <laughs> yep. <laughs> a pair a pair of SVS PB1000 subs, and he told SVS about it. He moved his surround speakers to correct locations and added four Atmos speakers at correct locations, and he told everybody who was in the room about it. <laughs> he kept his uh, Paradigm speakers because we told him to. <laughs> he ditched his Xbox One S for streaming because Xbox. And he played the Ultra HD Blu-ray of Jurassic Park as his first ever DTS-X disc. What did you think, I wonder? I mean, it blew me away. But that was, oh, he uh, was very impressed by it. Yeah, so that was yeah, that was it, a good it, choice. It's, it's sort of crazy. That that thing is just like, remember how we used to blow you away? That remember when the movie came out in theaters, everybody was like, "Oh my god, this is the best thing I've ever heard." Not, not much less seen. Mm-hmm. That's kind of what it is. On the the DTS X version is like that. So. <laughs> well, Andrew, all thank right. you very much for talking us up to all of those companies, and congrats on your AV Rant approved home theater. Yeah. Well, so again, a reminder, next week we will be interviewing, not me, Rob will be interviewing the owner of htmarket.com. That's on February 19th. So discuss home theater seating, and we can also discuss other things. So if you have some questions, get them into Rob. Don't don't wait. It's easier <laughs> to get them in now. For sure. In the news, Joey Esposito and Netflix, uh, I guess that's who it came from. Yeah. Esposito. I think I said that right. Netflix has the ability to turn off the autoplay and previews while browsing. If you didn't hear about this this week, then you don't have the internet and you don't care because <laughs> it was like on every news channel as if it were actual news. They've also added the option to turn off having the next episode of a show automatically play. You'll need to log into your account on the web browser, go to your account settings and scroll down to playback settings. By default, both autoplay fi- uh, features are checked and active, so you do have to manually uncheck them to turn them off these things affect playback on all devices they're tied to your account not your device so it's all or nothing which is yeah i tried to turn it off when i was uh the the auto preview the i don't mind the auto preview 
You know, mm -hmm. I actually like auto preview. I want to have the option of having it when I'm scrolling. But a lot of times, if I have Netflix on and my wife comes in the room to talk to me, it's like I have to mute it. Yeah. And then there's pictures going on, and I'm like... And the previews ha are louder than the normal show, which yeah. I dislike that very much. I'm very glad to have the ability, yeah. at least, to turn off the auto previews. Uh, Netflix themselves said, yeah, we heard lots of people uh, requesting that, and now that Disney Plus has started to eat our lunch, I guess we'll start doing things that people want us to do. That's my take on the whole thing. Uh, and I do yeah. like that. See, I like to watch the credits in a lot of shows, and that we're automatically going to start playing the next episode thing always cuts off part of the credits. So I'm like, when I want to watch the credits, I'm glad I have the ability to turn off that as well. So mm. I'm happy about both of these things. And uh, I put Joey's full name there because I'm a fan of his. He used to be the comics editor on IGN back in the day. Uh, but he has gone on to create his own independent comic books. And uh, I like to throw you know some support his way. So you can check out joeyesposito.com. That's his own website. He's got his independent comics for sale there. In particular, his All Ages comic which is uh captain ultimate which is is really good so check it out okay it's a plug there we go. i like comics yeah i like comics so netflix also does seem to care about uh, saving bandwidth as they are switching to the more efficient av1 codec from compatible android mobile devices that's good mm -hmm. you know, we should be doing that anyways disney is aim is aiming to bring hulu to markets outside of the united states in 2021 so hey I think they usually go to Australia first, don't they, for some reason? <laughs> I don't know why. But maybe the rest of you can have Hulu, too. Which Hulu is pretty good. And Viacom CBS wants to take on Disney... Oh, God. Mm -hmm. Disney Plus, HBO Max, and Peacock. Uh, taking on Peacock is not much of a fight, so picking on the little kid in the corner. <laughs> By combining CBS, Paramount, Comedy Central, MTV, and Nickelodeon streaming into a single streaming service. Guys, heads up. We don't want we don't want you guys to have all your all your own streaming services. That's not what we were looking for here. That's not why Netflix was so popular. Netflix was so popular because we get everything in one spot. Now you guys are splitting it off. We don't want that. You're gonna piss us off. That's what's gonna happen. Yeah. And some well, of you are gonna die, and then I, you'll have to you'll have to merge back into Netflix. Like, like I mean, I guess I'm a little bit more in favor of. So, I mean, we've got all these giant conglomerate companies, right? Because, you know, Disney yeah. owns a gazillion companies, as we know. And then Warner Brothers, of course, is HBO, but it's also Warner Brothers Studios. And it's also DC Comics. And uh, NBC is also NBC Universal. So it has all the Universal movies in there. And then, uh, you know, CBS Viacom is also Paramount. So I'm a little bit more in favor of if they're going to have these giant conglomerate companies that each of them has one streaming. Like, instead of having separate for Comedy Central right. and MTV and Nickelodeon and Paramount and CBS, like, all of those being individual, I'm a little more in favor of them all being one thing bundled together, but we're just going to have, you know, individual streaming services for each of the giants. Right. So this is my sort of take on Disney Plus, mm -hmm. right? Since I've gotten it and used it, it is like essential for watching for, for when you have guests over or kids mm. or anything like that. It is the streaming service to have because you can go on it. You know, whatever's going to be there is going to be fine for all ages. Everyone can find something they want to watch on Disney Plus. Mm -hmm. I don't care what age you are. You can find something up there that you want to watch. But... Day-to-day -day use, I almost never turn it on. I, I just I just don't. I don't. I haven't even finished The Mandalorian yet, which makes me a bad person. But our, me and the kids all got desynced on who, which episode we were uh, on. Right. And now we can't, we can't watch it together anymore. And it's sort of a thing. But that's neither here nor there. Oh. Well, but the, uh, you know, Netflix and Hulu. Hulu is my go-to daily. On Netflix sometimes. Looking forward to eventually getting Hulu in Canada, although 2021 yeah. is definitely later than I was anticipating. I thought mm -hmm. it would be here this year, but uh, yeah, they, they said it 2021. So hopefully early well, 2021. If they're going to if they're going to do the same business model of what mm -hmm. was on TV, you know, on certain channels last night will be on Hulu tonight, you know, right. the, the, the next day. That's that, that's no small for, feat to make that Absolutely happen. Absolutely true. I don't yeah. know if that is what they're going to do. I mean, now yeah. that it's all Disney and it's pretty much like everything that is above a PG-13 rating is going to be, you know, thrown onto Hulu. Most of the Fox content is going to be thrown onto Hulu. So it might just be that. That, that might mm. be it. Some comments here. Carla and Brian on Twitter. Let us know that Suspiria and Carnival Row both offer Atmos audio on Amazon Prime Video in addition to season one of Jack Ryan. So there's some more test material. Yep. Uh, Suspiria was supposed to be kind of okay. I don't know anything about it. It's Carnival Row, the one with the fairies or something. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's yeah, the okay. Cara Delevingne one. Yeah. I don't know. 
yeah, whatever. I, I it, there's too much stuff to watch. I can't keep up with all of it. And your your video is back in super janky form. Uh, I just captured the actual Skype window, so you're you're in a box. You are trapped in a box, and the quality is not great. But there, Help it's me. better than a I'm black trapped screen. in the box. That's right. Glass box of emotion. <laughs> John. John knows we pretty much always recommend uh, actual on-ceiling or in-ceiling Atmos speakers. We don't ever seem to recommend upwards-firing Atmos modules that bounce our sound off the ceiling, but he gave Emotiva's new $300 a pair Airmotive Air 1 Airspace, because apparently alliteration, model a try, <laughs> and he thinks they sound fantastic. I, I'm sure they do. We've heard lots of uh, reports that on you know bouncy ones do. I don't think they bounce. I don't yeah. think that's what they're doing. But once but again, this whatever. is a more highly directional tweeter being used here. Yeah. And I think that is key. I am highly suspect that a quite directional tweeter is key for this to work in any way. So makes sense. Hmm. And I'm glad that you are enjoying well, them. That makes sense, too, because uh, what clips were, were the go-tos for this. And Klipsch has a pretty highly direct, directional uh, tweeter as well. So. Mm -hmm. Not surprised. Dan, we might recall Dan's dedicated theater with this full complement of Paradigm speakers. After the, his installation of bass traps made such a huge difference, he turned his attention to his JVC X790 projector opti optimization. He previously, previously asked uh, if he should attempt to use his entry-level color meter with JVC's own proper calibration software or perhaps invest in any new CalMen license. Ugh. That seems expensive. But we urged him to use that money to hire a professional calibrator instead. He found an ISF and THX calibrator who is actually a calibration instructor. I might have been my instructor. Who knows? <laughs> As well. And uh, and since we've had a few questions lately about whether professional calibration is worth it or not, Dan wanted to share his experience. Not only is he extremely impressed with the improvements that the professional calibration made to his projected image, but his calibrator also explained the adjustments he was making and basically taught Dan a lot of what he might learn in an ISF or THX training course. So Dan feels it was a tremendous value, both for the results and for the education. Dan's friend came over after and remarked that the projected image looks on par with the C9 OLED now, and we were 100% right that the meters used for the calibration are in, in an entirely different league from Dan's color meter. Yeah, dude, it's like the gun thing. It's crazy. Yeah. So Dan wants, us, wants to encourage people to give professional calibration a try, but do your research and hire a calibrator who's willing to explain things along the way. I think that's the difference right there. I think that you know, the, the image difference you got probably is something that's attainable, you know, at least, you know, uh, within a couple of percentage points by any, you know, responsible, respectable calibrator that you might get. But uh, sitting there and talking to you the entire time, not all the calibrators are going to do that. That is absolutely the case. Yeah, you can't you can't necessarily expect that of everyone. Um, yeah. That is not necessarily what they're, you know, advertising that they provide. Uh, but there is absolutely no harm in you call them and you say, this is, you know, is this something you're willing to do? Are you willing to talk to me while you do it? Maybe some will charge a little bit more because it'll add time to the process. Right. Uh, but right. I, I completely agree that you're getting a lot more value from that education than, you know, I mean, yeah, yeah, you can hire somebody who just says, you know what, get out of the room, come back when I'm done, and that's all you get out of it. And if that's what you want, mm -hmm. cool. Uh, but there is more on offer potentially than just the display itself. Well, like I mean, that. you can make the, the argument that the talking it through is most of the value because I, right. I, I, I do believe that the calibration, while it, it does make a difference, we've said this over and over again, it will be different and better. It, will it be like $200 or $300 better? Mm -hmm. in, in my mind, it, it isn't. But sitting there and going through it with somebody is yeah. worth something. And if I oh, were yeah. a professional calibrator, I would be encouraging myself and all of my colleagues to do this because – Agreed. You know, it's 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 like you know you need to justify your existence in, in this <laughs> thing happening. And the more time you spend with people, the more time things you explain to them, the more that you know questions you answer, the better you know experience they're going to have, and the better Yelp review you're going to get out of this yep. thing. So and appreciation you know. for everything that yeah. you did. Yeah. 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 So Damien on Twitter might have found a convenient low-cost seating riser solution. After his back row couch tipped over when he was using uh, bed leg risers, he went back to a different bedding solution, a box spring. It seems to be just about perfect, and now he plans to just secure a piece of plywood on top for a proper platform and cover the whole thing in fabric to make it look nice. So he has a box spring on the ground, which... That's right. I mean, it's a thing. It should it work. I mean, it should be able to support your weight and whatnot, right? One would think. Yeah. 
don't know. I guess it depends on the box spring. Seems I mean, like it can a couch support a mattress and two people lying on top of it. So yeah, I know, but th 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 now we're supporting a couch, a couch as well. With, yes, with what, three to five people on it. I yeah. mean, yeah, I would probably secure plywood to the top and bottom, and I would open up the, the mm. sides and like put in material to help it be inert. But you know, yeah, whatever. beef it up a little it's bit, fun. but. Yeah. You know what? Hey, hey if, as long as it's working, you know, right. hey, you, 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 your couch fell over and nobody died. I'm sure this will be no worse. So there you go. <laughs> Daryl, let's get the questions here. And Daryl, starting with Daryl, it is stupidly hot in this room. Mm, I cannot believe that in February I yeah. ran the AC last night because it was so hot. <sighs> My life. Daryl. Don't move to Florida. Please, people, stop moving to Florida. It's uh, not It's not what they tell you it is. Really wasn't considering it, so I'm not. No, I right know you're that. not. <laughs> I told my wife I wanted to move near mountains. She goes, well, I'm not I'm not really interested in moving someplace that's not near a beach. I'm like, they have lake lakes near mountains. The, the West like, Coast no. has both. I know, but the water's too cold. Everybody knows that. <laughs> Daryl. Daryl's theater area is about 15 and a half by 16 by 9, but it's open on one side to his kitchen and dining room. He's expanded to a 7.2.4 configuration and already owns a five-channel monolith am amplifier. He has decided he wants to go with Anthem, but he should he get their MRX1120 receiver or the M I'm sorry, AVM60 Prepo? Obviously, with the Prepro, he'd have to buy more external, external amplifiers, so would there be any sound quality difference to make that worth it? Can I say no? Because, I mean, I don't, what speakers does he have? He didn't say what speakers he didn't has. Didn't say what speakers. Didn't... And there is one little wrinkle to this, which is that in the instances of Anthem's um, receivers that can go up to 11 speakers, you don't mm. have the option of reassigning what channels the internal amplifiers power. The internal amplifiers always power the seven bed layer speakers and your four overhead speakers have to be powered externally you don't get a choice about that so you'd end up using this very powerful five channel monolith amplifier essentially just to power your four overhead speakers and i guess your center as well maybe um but the other thing about the anthems is that the internal amplifiers are not all equal power the first five channels, the left, center, right, and the surround left and surround right, they have higher wattage than the two surround back speakers, which is not mm. a gigantic deal whatsoever, but it's just something to be aware of. So if his thinking process was that he was going to use the five channel monolith amplifier to power his five main floor level speakers, you don't have that option with the receiver. So that might decide it right. He might just be like, well, that's it, because that's right, what I right, want right, to right. do, and now I'm going to get the pre-pro. Um, that's a really terrible option on <laughs> Anthem's part. I don't understand why that design is like that. That's like, uh, we would much rather you buy our pre-pro. So we're going to do this to our amp our receiver. It could be, yeah. There's just a, to a little of that sure. going on. But mm -hmm. um, if you have, so I mean, his room is not gigantic. No, So there is no chance that he's sitting exceedingly far away from any of his speakers. That's what I thought too, yeah. If your speakers are normal 8-ohm, 87, 89 decibel efficiency speakers, the MRX 1120 is entirely up to the fa task. In fact, in fact, the one step down from that, I think that's the 820 or 720, something, some number like that, uh, also would be up to the task. You don't even have to go all the way up to the MRX 1120 in Anthem's lineup to still get 11 speakers. So, uh, I mean, my vote is almost always going to be for receiver when you can. Because yeah. the the AVM60 by itself costs more, and then you must also add even more external amplifiers. Yeah, four, yeah. Uh, I'm always going to tell you that the the sound quality difference is absolutely not going to be worth it. But if you had the plan in mind, where you're like I will accept nothing but powering my five main speakers with the monolith, it made the choice for you. Right, and once we read this next question, you're going to understand why. Mm he really isn't going to have a problem powering okay. his speakers. So he, he is looking to make a change from his front three speakers. He wants uh, oh. four to his front three speakers. He wants to use bookshelf speakers instead of towers. And his front runners are the SVS Ultra plus the Ultra Center. His concern is that he's coming from Klipsch. Uh-huh. So clearly power was never an issue in here, but, you know, whatever. And his side surrounds are already Klipsch end walls. But he doesn't really want to remove and replace. Will those be a terrible timbre mismatch? Normally, I would, in, in most 
all cases, I would say timbre would not be an issue, much of an issue between your fronts and your your surrounds. Mm-hmm. Normally, I would not say that. I am not so much worried about the timbre mismatch as I am in the power handling mismatch and how much power it's going to take to get to 75 db from your front speakers which are further away from you mm. uh then your surrounds which are clip speakers which will be exceedingly more efficient one would think <laughs> Tip- yeah, but i don't know which clips he's got and you know i would worry that uh I would worry that having the, the those speakers paired together might make it so that it's nigh impossible to get them tam- uh, level matched. Um, yeah, I mean, again, given that it's such a small room, given that the ultras are not like inefficient, no, um, they're not. I don't. Hmm. It just depends. I mean, he's his room is what fifteen feet wide, fifteen and a half feet wide, or sixteen feet wide, one or the other. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, he's going to be sitting like on top of those surround speakers. They're going to yeah. be right there, and the likely the the front speakers are going to be. I I would say ten feet in front of him, maybe. You know, right. would be my guess. You know, nine ten nine feet in front of him, ten feet, eleven feet, twelve feet, somewhere in that range. You know, you're talking about a, a lot more power has to go into the front than it does into those surrounds, and that would be my concern. Okay, Tamber would be a concern. You yeah, know, a little if bit. you're going to be because uh, they definitely don't, they're not going to be sounding. Yeah, the same. if you put them all up go- front and compare them, maybe you yeah. would be able to tell the difference. Um, but I mean, so- when you go around to the surrounds and the surround backs from your fronts, you know, you don't unless it's a really, you know, a, a, a really definitive pan right, all the way right, around right. the room. You generally don't notice it that much. Yeah, uh, I mean, this would be a case where I certainly wouldn't be like, oh, I must buy seven all new SVS speakers immediately. I would absolutely yeah. give it a try because yes. keeping your clip surround speakers definitely you will be fine with the power output of the anthem receiver so that's not yet another argument to go with the receiver first even though yes the receiver is having to power the floor level speakers except i guess you can power your center separately um so yeah, i would certainly give it a try and if you're like this is unacceptable then yeah there could be a timbre mismatch if you're hypercritical of it it could exist there will be a power efficiency mismatch and you might end up purchasing some more SVS speakers in the not too distant future. It's possible. Do you hate the sound of Klipsch speakers now? Is there something wrong with the Klipsch speakers <laughs> up front? Because if there's not, then what about Klipsch bookshelf speakers? And then we suddenly don't have this issue anymore. I mean, I mean if he already Klipsch... has Klipsch fronts, maybe yeah. maybe he just stays. <laughs> well, he doesn't want, I guess they're towers. He doesn't want towers anymore. He wants bookshelves, which is mm, fine true, too. True, true, true. But yeah. I mean, but you can get Klipsch bookshelves and you can get other horn loaded speakers that are bookshelves as well. Yeah. So. I don't know. There's options. Let us know what you do, Michael. I don't think we were very helpful at all on that one. I well, feel. I feel like we, I we're feel talking like we, through it. I mean, it's hard to give a definitive because we don't. We we're not going to give a definitive answer when we don't feel definitively about it. I know, and you know, I, I, my my. If somebody came to me and said, "I have clip speakers all around, and I want to change my front speakers to SVS," mm. my reaction would be, "Not not that I don't like SVS." But it would be like, uh, I'd be hesitant to say yes mm. because of all the things that could p- potentially not go right, right in this situation. Tamper mismatch, power handling mismatching. Yep. You know, uh, you know, if you like clip speakers, why are you switching from clip speakers to something that is def- you know, definitely not a clip speaker? Although SVS, yeah. very safe choice because free yeah. two-way shipping. Oh, yeah. So. yeah, 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 yeah. Speaking of free, too, they haven't sent me speakers yet, so I don't know what's going on with that. I haven't even heard from them, so maybe they changed their mind, which would be fine, too. Wouldn't bother me. Michael. Michael uh, says, Robin Lee went over Michael's new setup in which he's using an Amazon Fire TV Cube as a playback device for almost all of his content. Our answers weren't 100% spot on, but like Tom described before, they got him to check in the right vicinity, and now he has his AirPlay and the audio problem sorted out. A firmware update and reboot of his router got his AirPlay working again, and his Fire <laughs> TV Cube has an audio output setting called Best Available, there and I got his surround sound working. So Michael says, thanks for helping with all of that. Yeah, dude, like, I would love to think that we are, like, robots, and sometimes Rob comes off as one, honestly, <laughs> but we are not. <laughs> you know, we, Definitely We do not, not have... We do not have memory banks that remember all these things and get everything right every single time. And it, it's it's all so very, you know, like, if you know something about one model of TV, you know something about that model of TV. It doesn't mm. ever seem to translate. Sometimes within the same model year, down the it's like, oh, by the way, in the, you know, 700 series, you know, this setting is here. But in the 600 series, yeah. it doesn't exist. Yeah. 
Anyway, so Michael is in Canada is about ready to drop cable TV completely, but which streaming services in Canada offer the best audio quality and content? So far, Amazon Prime Video hasn't been terribly impressive. Agreed. It's been, get, it's been getting better on my end, I'll tell oh, you that good. much. But, you know, I mean, the, the, the lip sync issue has finally gone away. Ah, seems. good, good, good. But uh, yeah, in Canada, as far as audio quality, because, of course, uh, Michael is one of our listeners who is visually impaired, so the audio quality matters more to him than the video quality. And who is streaming good audio quality? Well, Netflix is right up there. Uh, sure. Disney Plus is actually yep. right up there. Uh, they're both very good in Canada. And that's about it. Uh, because right. so I mean the service that we have that actually has the most content including like pretty much uh, you know catch up from all our broadcast uh, networks here in Canada as well as you can access HBO through there you can access Showtime through there that's called Crave uh, it's from Bell Media and they offer Crave to anybody who wants to subscribe to it and in terms of just the breadth of content Crave TV is a very good service but Almost everything is in stereo. Uh, there is yeah. 5.1 content, but nothing better than Dolby Digital 5.1. And even regular TV shows that are broadcast or on cable in 5.1 are just stereo um, mm -hmm. for a lot of it. So I can't tell you that it has the best audio quality. It flat out doesn't. But just sheer breadth of content, if you're looking to replace cable, then in that sense, Crave TV is a good option. You know, if, if there's just a show it has that nobody else has. But yeah, Netflix, Disney Plus are the best quality in Canada. All right. Jeff. Jeff has an OLED TV. If he puts up a full screen, a gray screen, the screen uniformity at brighter levels is basically perfect to his eyes, which is something he is, appreciates since he can easily spot the dirty screen effect on pretty much all LCD TVs. And of course, full black is perfect, which again, LCD TVs can't match. Well, full black... It, a local array dimming should be an absolutely same. black screen yeah, yes yeah. yeah a dark 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 gray screen that's would right. be different yeah. <laughs> or one sure. one that's almost all black but a little speck of white somewhere and then the nice bloom yeah. of halo around it <laughs> But for the 5%, 10%, 50% levels just above black, you can see quite a few vertical bands, and those bands are visible with actual content if it's a mostly dark scene with a lot of 5 to 15% uh, content and shadows. Is there any way to improve or circumvent this dark vertical banding? Will uh, yes, sorry. <laughs> will it get any better or worse with time? Well, it won't change with time. Uh, I don't think that uh, like the a, a vertical wine. banding almost certainly yeah. not um, yeah. if you have like a tiny bit of image retention that can actually get corrected over time as it does its panel cycling um, right. that sort of you know if it's not full out burning which almost never is uh, usually it's a little bit of image retention or something like that that can get better over time but the vertical banding unfortunately was pretty much just inherent to the panels themselves technically it's still there however I, I will flat out tell you that the OLED TVs being manufactured today certainly seem to be better on that front. Not, com you know, if you want a pixel peep at it, you can still find it, but they mm. definitely seem to have improved it. Uh, back Going back to the 2016, 2017 models, it was like, they got vertical bands. There's there's nothing we can do about this in the dark grays. They were just there. Uh, but it seems to have gotten better, particularly in like the 2019 models. So uh, there is that if it's really, really bothering you. I mean, trying to tell you to upgrade one OLED to another when, I mean, really most of the picture hasn't changed very much at all. But if that's the thing that gets you is the vertical banding. But unfortunately, there really isn't a fix for that. That uh, dark vertical banding is the trade-off you get for not having dirty screen effect in the brights, which the LCDs will give you. No display is perfect. Excuse me. Oh, my God, dude. Like <laughs> Went down the wrong pipe. Air. It did. Yep. Mm. You all right? So you can't just turn down brightness a touch to get I mean, this. then you'd, you'd crush blacks, which I know. still wouldn't help you at, like, the 10% level, you know, because the 10% right. level, you're still going to see it, and the, the vertical bands are unfortunately just there. They're just kind of in the panel itself, mm. unfortunately. I think that Lee experienced that, too, He right? sure did. He was, he was, yeah. He was, and that was going from, he went from a 2017 to a 2018, <coughs> and his 2018 was much better. Like, he's, you know... If you scrutinize it, you can still find them, but it's now at the point where when you're watching normal content, you're not going to mm. notice it. Yeah. Okay. Monty, 
Ever since Monty bought his new house, he's been excited to have his first projection set up in the bonus room that he'll be turning into a theater. But even after advice about layout and setup, he's finding himself stressed out about exactly where his seats will go, exactly how big his projection screen should be, and exactly where to install his speakers. The house is still new to him. He hasn't even watched anything at all in the bonus room yet, so what do we think of the following idea? Instead of trying to plan it all out ahead of time, what if he just got a nice 65-inch flat panel and started with a 5.2 speaker setup? It would allow him to freely move his seats around and more easily move the display and speakers as well. He could get used to uh, get used out of the room, I guess, to try different layouts and orientations, and then once he's found what he likes best, he could get the appropriate screen size, install a projector, and fill out this immersive audio system. Does it seem reasonable to start with a smaller system like this, or is he overthinking it, and he should just go the whole hog right away? No, you. I think it's ridiculous to buy a 65-inch TV and put it in here, I'll be honest with you, unless you have a space for a 65-inch TV someplace else. <laughs> someplace well, I else would in do. the house. Although, if you yeah. get a nice one, selling it won't be that difficult. Please. We're just throwing money away. I don't throw money away, Rob. That's not how I roll. <laughs> so I would buy the projector that you want, okay. and I would make sure that the projector that you want has uh, plenty of throw yep. range. You lots know. of zoom and range, lots I, of lens yeah. shift. Yep. Then I would, you know, get a, a tall bookshelf or something, put it in the back of the room mm -hmm. or, you know, put it wherever you want in this room, put the projector on it, project to the screen. So what you would need to buy is this, you know, you know, your two or three front speakers, if you want. Sure. Uh, the projector and the seats. That's it. Yeah, don't buy the actual screen yet. Yeah. Because... Project that bad boy. Uh, and if you yeah. need, if you just need to put up like white sheets sure. on your and just cover up your entire wall and then you know play around with the projector yeah. this is not going to be a three month oh i'm not sure should i have it mm. at 65 or 67 no you're just going to go this is too big this is too small this range right here is where i want True. then you're going to go online and say okay i liked 92 and then here's a 100 inch screen i'll take it it's close enough mm -hmm. And then you're going to be done. And then three days later, Amazon's going to deliver it and you'll be done. So this is going to be a afternoon figuring mm. out what screen you want. Maybe a weekend. Yeah. yeah. And uh, there's not that many places you can put your – we will allow you to put your t your seats. So <laughs> it's not going to be in the midway of the room because that's bad for audio. Although his has to be so, pretty close in the setup that he's got. But pretty close right. is still not exactly, so that's okay. All right. So you're either going to be in the in the front third or the back third of the room, somewhere in that one third ish range. <laughs> so just be just behind the the middle of the room or just in front of the middle of the room, and you can just say, "Oh, I want my seats here. I want my seats here." And then there's not going to be a whole lot of options there. And then you're going to say, "If it's if they're in the back third of the room, the screen I I want the entire screen to be the entire wall." Which mm. I don't know if that's going to be the case with you. And you're like, "I can't do that because it's false wall and it's a bunch of yeah." Expense, no, his was the one that. that has the the angled section at the front there, yeah, so yeah, the screen yeah. kind of has to fit below it. But uh, no, yeah. yeah, actually, yeah, I because I was kind of thinking I don't mind Monty's idea here, but no, you're absolutely right that getting the projector but just not getting the screen yet gives yeah. you all the flexibility to play around. And you know what? Throwing that projector just onto your wall, even if your wall isn't a pure white wall right now, like you can still watch it. It's it's yeah. un, I mean unless you've got a pitch black wall but we know he doesn't have that yeah. um, so I mean you can still watch it you'll still have an image you can figure out exactly the size you can play around with all the rest starting with a smaller speaker system um, I mean as long as it's not the AV receiver or the pre-pro that you're going to have to upgrade because that's going to be a lot of money but I mean starting with like 5.2 speakers and getting more speakers later on that's totally fine to me because right. easily that can and be I, added to and, and I said <clears throat> Excuse me. I said, you know, your front two speakers, you know, that right. if you had nothing. I, I was assuming you have nothing, right. right? The front two speakers, just so that you can hear something. Yes. Yeah. You know, and if you decide, okay, well, I like those speakers or I don't like those speakers, mm. you send them back or whatever. Yeah. But if you like them, but I want towers up front or I want the, a bigger bookshelf mm. up front, you move them to the surrounds or the surround backs. Yeah. And, and it's just around. one pair of speakers. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. All right. We sorted yeah. that out. Infinite Gary, we mentioned how a lot of receivers today include some sort of listening mode or processing that's supposed to, to retrieve what was lost in lossy compressed music signals. And sure enough, while he was researching, oh, Yamaha's got it for sure, mm -hmm. researching the Yamaha receivers that we suggested to him, he came across their compressed music enhancer in the manual. The description reads, uh, it should say, you know, slash BS alert or whatever. Uh, adds depth and breadth to sound, allowing you to enjoy a dynamic sound close to the original sound before it was compressed. So, can we explain what this feature actually does? Is it worth using or is it something to avoid? Gary, you can play with it. It's just... Sure. It, it, it just uses an algorithm mm -hmm. to try to say, okay, if 
you know, this was, if this is the compress, what could have been left out, and we'll try to add a little dynamic range. We'll make a list a little bit louder and this a little bit softer, and, uh, or whatever they do. No one knows. I don't even it's know that proprietary. It's like dynamic range stuff in the volume. A lot of it is like, it just adds a little bit more in the high frequency because that tends yeah. to be a lot of what gets taken out in the data well, compression. And the, and the low, low frequencies. And the low, too. low frequencies yeah. as well. Yeah, it tends yeah. to be a little bit of that. So it's, I mean, you basically look like, okay, we're seeing something at eight kilohertz in the signal. There was probably something at 16. We'll throw a little extra up there, which you might yeah. not even hear whatsoever. And same down in the base. Yeah, here's something at uh, 180. Well, there's probably something down at 92 that, that might have got compressed. Enhanced. Out music compressor or a decompressor or whatever the heck they call it mm. uh, i've already scrolled past it they introduced that when ipods were yeah. introduced that's right. that's how old it that is. thing is yeah. so yes it is there because yamaha is like a hoarder when it comes to dsp <laughs> the, modes. well but everybody has something like that you know so they do the, but uh, it was back in the day uh, of it, mp3 you're absolutely right if Yamaha puts out a, a, adds a DSP to their receivers, <laughs> it is never going away. It's like a governmental agency. Once it gets funded, That's it true. doesn't. It never gets. One of our fans might still be using it. And we don't want to take it away on them. Right. So the Dolby surround up mixer never uses front wide speakers, correct? But actual Atmos can use front wide speakers. Yes. I don't think any of I think i don't think that front wides are used by anybody about what uh dts x oh is that right? no that's not true uh so the, the first part is correct dolby surround up mixer will never put any sound into front wide speakers but actual atmos soundtracks if they use objects in the floor mm -hmm. layer mm -hmm. then if you have front wide speakers the dolby atmos renderer inside of your av receiver or pre pro can say okay this object said to move from the front left speaker location to the surround left speaker location but i have a front wide left speaker in between those two things the object should pass through there and the renderer is smart enough to make that sound come out of your front wide speaker in such an instance but well actually though we'll come on to it in the next of his question what i was about right, to say right. so here we go <laughs> So is there any way to tell whether a given Atmos movie actually uses the front wide positions though? Is it possible you could watch an Atmos movie and your front wides would never make a single sound or does the AV receiver or pre-pro sound, uh, pre -pro process sound into the front wides no matter what? Well, it, it, Rob just answered that question. Yeah, so if it's an object at the base level, then yes. Right. But many times they, they do channels. That's right. You know, they, they mix into channels. Yeah. And that's just, that's just, I won't call it lazy mixing. I will call it, I've been doing this for 20 years. That's right. <laughs> and Objects I'll be damned if I'm going to stop. I'll be damned if I'm going to stop right now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So it is absolutely possible to have an Atmos, you know, Ultra HD Blu-ray where you play it in Atmos. It says Atmos on your AV receiver. You have front wide speakers and a sound never comes out of either of your front wide speakers. That is totally possible. Wonder Woman is a perfect example of that. No sounds ever come out of your front wide speakers with Wonder Woman's Atmos mix because they just did it all as channels. Uh, so yeah, that can entirely be the case. Now, let's see. There is the Monoprice HTP1. Well, actually, that's the next question, so I'll answer it here. Yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> so is, the, is there any receiver or pre-pro model besides the Trinov attitude, altitude that can create front-wide sounds even if they don't actually exist in uh, Atmos soundtrack? Well, there's the Monoprice one. Yeah. Yeah, I the Monoprice HTP-1. say two seconds ago. That's right. Um, <laughs> now, the thing is, that's only the case if you're using... So they have a really cool thing because uh, you have the DTS Neural X Up Mixer, uh, mm -hmm. and that is limited to 11 speakers total. But in the case of the Monoprice HTP-1, they did a thing where they put their own sauce onto the Neural X Up Mixer, uh, and they have a thing called Synthesis, where it will start with what Neural X did to 11 speakers, and then synthesize front wide speakers and synthesize top middles in between your front heights and rear heights. So you can have a full 9.1.6 configuration going in Neural X with the Monoprice HTP-1, and the Trinov Altitude can do a very similar thing too, because of course Trinov can always do things of creating new speakers in between others speakers but that's it now the thing is though if it's a genuine atmos soundtrack that's not going to happen because when genuine right. atmos comes into it, it's going to go well that's atmos is going to activate the atmos decoder and it's going to be atmos not dts neural x the workaround trick you could try would be to have your player do the decoding output as pcm and one way you could right. do that is by 
activating secondary audio in your player because secondary audio prevents Atmos bit streams from coming out of the player. Instead, you will just get 7.1 True HD or 7.1 PCM. And to those types of signals, you can apply the Neural X up mixer, but then you don't have like actual overheads it's like extracting what it thinks should be overheads via the neural x up mixer and then synthesizing speakers in between it's a very convoluted way of doing this gary and it wouldn't work for any of your streaming services uh but there you go i get into the nitty-gritty when you ask there you go <laughs> since rob is mr front wide speakers how would you describe the difference in the way atmos soundtracks sound with it versus without front wides well it doesn't exist <laughs> it just, well it sure does but, i mean sometimes they make sounds if you got objects oh, well, okay in yeah objects the floor right, layer right, right, uh, i right. mean and that is primarily where i so in terms of when do i notice that my front wides are actually doing something well it's in a movie like, say, the first Avengers movie where they have a full circling pan of sound that is like a true circle going right around you and they used objects in that because it's very obvious that sound came out of my wide speakers as it made that circle and it was noticeable. Most of the time, I wouldn't be able to tell you. That's me and I'm going to flat up say I wouldn't be able to tell you whether they're, whether they're there or not. They're not like obvious and noticeable and if you took them away, I very well might not notice. <laughs> so where are all the receiver models that can do front wides or just more than 7.2.4 for that matter? Well, they're at Denon and they're at the, <laughs> that's it. Are there, there are a number of pre-pros, but as far as receivers with some amplification built in, is the Denon the X8500H it? Why doesn't Marantz have a sis, even have a sister model? Uh, they will probably. Uh, uh, I mean, dude, the, the, uh, honestly, the market for this is like, you and like 20 other people that listen to this podcast i i i'm I, and i i'm being honest with you i know it seems like you know everybody's talking about this stuff that's because we're talking to each other and yes. we're the only people talking about this uh, I, I i don't even see like other like home theater dedicated channels on youtube yeah. and stuff like ever even mention why <laughs> it's it's really rare we are the source we're the place to come to talk about it but i have fun with it um Rance's sister model to the x8500h is the av 8805 pre-pro that's how they right. did things they just the pre-pro model is in Marantz's lineup like denon doesn't have a pre-pro so right right Marantz gets the pre-pro Pro version, Denon gets the receiver version. They split things up that way. Um, so, I mean, he himself found out that, uh, you know, like he, he called Mono Price and they're like, yeah, we don't have really plans to make a receiver version of the HTP1 at this time. It's not like it's impossible. They might consider it, but not happening right now. Um, Audioholics uh, I... covered uh, audio control back at Cedia in 2019, and audio control was like, yeah, we're going to have two different 9.1.6 AV receivers, but Nothing's been added to their website, and it's all based on the RCAM, which is now owned by Harman. And uh, the people who have been testing out the RCAM uh, pre-pro have been like, yeah, this thing has problems. So that might be a little while. <laughs> right. I, uh, you know, like I said, I mean, this is... I just don't think it's a selling point, and that's why they're not going to do it. I mean, I mean I just we, don't had, th we had them for quite a few years, you know, when it was Odyssey right. DSX and then DTS Neo X. We, right. we had receivers with So they know how well while. that they, how, the, how well this feature moves receivers. Yeah. And I'm guessing, like, like that much. It moves yeah. them that much. You know, it, we're not talking like, oh, they're flying. Out. People are not upgrading because they want wides. Honestly, people aren't upgrading because they want Atmos. We just have it. You know? <laughs> it's just Yeah, I mean, if buying a seven-channel receiver, it's going to have Atmos now. It's only going to be two overheads, but you're going to have it whether or you want it or Or two surround backs. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's still Atmos. It so. still is. Yeah. I And honestly, I... I hundred percent believe that the reason that there is no reason for the surround backs to be atmos other than they want atmos to to activate on their on the front of their receiver yeah, so, so that people feel atmos, like yeah. they got something i think that's <laughs> i'm think not that's what super duper angry at 9.1.6 being reserved for the high end i'm not angry at that i think that makes sense i think that is the only crowd it's, that's going to be looking at it it's super niche yeah. and uh super niche people are more than willing to buy amplifiers separately mm. And it, to them, they're like... In fact, many we'll will it, want it that way, won't they? Yeah. yeah. We'll put it in this thing. And if, you know, because it's a pre-pro and the pre-pro people, you know, they want all the stuff anyways. Mm -hmm. So they'll also buy the amplifiers or they already have the amplifiers. So, you know, it's just easier. It's more money for us either way. 
Ryan. Ryan has an Epson 5050 UB and a 135-inch uh, silver ticket sc white screen. How can he determine whether he's getting correct light level, uh, light output levels in his in nits for HDR? Uh, 135 is awfully large. That's about as big like as the, you can go. Yeah. Um, so I mean, right? You you can go by the measured light output that is quoted by places like projector central or projector right reviews, that's what i would do right yeah. and then you can take like they will tell you okay in this picture mode um with you know the the lamp set this way and the lens set this way this is approximately how many lumens are coming out of this projector um you divide those number of lumens by the number of square feet of your screen and that will give you foot lamberts you then convert foot lamberts to nits you can you can do that. Well, in fact, Projector right. Central their their uh, their calculator unfortunately isn't like soup because they're just going by whatever the highest specified lumen output is. So you can't really just go by the Projector Central calculator. Um, but yeah, if you if you look at the actual review and figure out how many lumens this thing has, now that'll that should give you a very close ballpark idea. Now to actually confirm whether in your setup because your screen has whatever gain it has, and maybe your ma screen manufacturer said, well, this is a one point three gain screen, but if you truly measured it it's right. 1.25 right? Um, right, right and right. you can say well my particular unit of this model you know projector model it didn't hit the 1200 lumens that projector central quoted it hit 1120 or so you know like it's entirely possible that these are happening so to truly confirm the exact nits like you'd have to measure with a light meter uh there's really no way around that um you'd want to measure what is reflecting off the screen because that, that's what you're seeing. You wouldn't want to just point the light meter at the lens of the projector. So, yeah, I mean, you can do that with a light meter. Uh, would a lux meter get you... A lux meter would get you close as long as you hold it exactly one meter away. Mm. Yeah. So the specs say his 5050 UB can deliver 100% of DCI-P3 color. Does that mean it is 100% accurate without a calibration, or are they just saying it has wider colors? It says it can. it is physically capable of doing all of the colors. That's what it's saying. Yeah, it's it doesn't no, mean, no it, claim it, it, on has, accuracy. It, yeah, accuracy has nothing to do with this. Lot, lots of things could do 100%. Color, uh, not lots, but... Well, not lots. You, no. know, <laughs> you know, there you can make a projector or a device that put that can put that out, but it you know could have all sorts of accuracy right. issues. Yeah, no, you know, as, but as it has the ability. We, we have uh, points on a diagram of where red, green, and blue should be. Uh, they have coordinates attached to them. Now, as long as whatever is making your image can put red, green, and blue either at those points or a little beyond them, you can mm -hmm. claim, well, I can hit that full spectrum of colors. I can hit that full gamut because I can either hit those points or a little bit beyond them. That doesn't mean that they are actually exactly on those points. That would That's the accuracy part of it. Are they actually exactly on those points? If they're a little bit beyond, you can rein them back in. And that would get yeah. you to accuracy. So, yeah, it's not claiming it's 100% accurate without calibration. No. So he did say what we always say not to do. He got his projector and screen all set up, and he was loving it. But then he started reading the internet, forums, mm -hmm. Facebook, home theater groups, you know, the like. Mm -hmm. And now the fans of gray screens have gotten in his head. So what are the pros and cons of his white versus gray, dark gray, or black screens? The pros are white screens are good, and all the rest of them suck. How about that? You Pretty like close. That? <laughs> I am willing to say that today's actual, like, properly designed, uh, they, if you could zoom in on them, they look like saw teeth where the top of the sawtooth is blacked out and the bottom of the sawtooth is reflective and they're designed specifically for ambient light rejecting situations that those right. screens, which cost a pretty penny, and, like, my favorite one, as I've mentioned, is Alune Visions, um, you know, I'm, I, I can make a use case for those, but they're not, they're not cheap. All else, I'm like, black out your room, go with a white screen. I have never liked gray screens. I know there are people who do. I don't understand it. I mean, there there are some great videos, like, supposedly showing you the benefits of gray screens, like, just on YouTube. And if they ever show you clouds, it's like, well, those clouds aren't white. Like, right. if it's if they actually show up beside a white screen. Like, yeah, I've... the white screen is, is washed out. 
Right. But I've, ne I've never really light. understood the whole idea of not having a white screen. I mean, I've seen light rejecting. I've seen yeah. ones that are meant to be used in high, you know, in like retail settings sure, and stuff sure, like sure. that. And they, they do. They work. They look yeah. great. And, and a okay? white screen there wouldn't make sense. It would be it so doesn't. washed out. It would be pointless. But so, yeah. Where, where are you watching this? Are you watching it on the floor of Best Buy? Or are you watching it in a room that has a modicum of light control and you sometimes watch at night because if that's the case white screens make the most i mean the sense. gray screen yes. started when we got the first affordable lcd hd projectors and they had bad black levels yeah, and the yeah. only way to get anything approaching a reasonable black level was to tint the screen gray so that it brought everything down but then whites weren't white anymore i just nope i'm not in favor the of same gray. people who have their gray screens to get their black and blacks, whatever, yeah. you know, they, these are the people who will have like, they'll paint their entire theater black. They'll do like mm -hmm. all sorts of crazy things, but then they're white. They're, they're skewing all the, the, the whites and everything else. Right. I, and all the colors are a little bit weird. <laughs> they are. No, I don't yep. understand it. No. I don't understand it. Yeah. So uh, if you want your mind put at ease, Ryan, and I don't know if this is going to do it, but, uh, there are so many very, very specific situations, very specific situations where Rob and I will recommend a non-white screen. Okay. But it, I mean, it is so specific that uh, <laughs> y you certainly do not fit the bill here. I mean... No, really doesn't it, yeah. sound like it. What I do wish still existed from somebody is an actual retro-reflective white screen. I mean, we used to have Daylight's high power, but they don't seem to offer it anymore, and nobody else ever did and hasn't started to offer retro-reflective screens. They are a little bit problematic in how you have to set up your projector for them to work but if you do they were great because you got white and because it's retro reflective light that was coming in from angles got sent back to where it came from into your instead of to your eyes i right. liked those but nobody makes them i mm. alas so he put all his money into a new projector so he's stuck with this old sony receiver that can only handle 1080p he has 11 speakers on hand but he's only using seven right now he really wants to get a navy receiver that can handle 4k and hdr but he has only 300 bucks to spend right now over accessories for less that could get his him a denon x 2400h or 2500h should he get either of those models or should he get something different well all those models will pass through the things that you're talking yes. about yeah so that's not a problem but uh you've got 11 speakers on hand and they certainly mm -hmm. won't none of neither of those will power all those speakers so now you're looking at an amplifier purchase uh you're gonna be looking for well, an amplifier purchase no matter what not, you know, not just that it, it those models flat out can't do more than seven yeah. speakers yeah. so you, you know I, I don't see any reason for you to, I, I say save your money and get yeah. something like the 3600 yep. or 3500 or whatever and uh then you can power everything but the but two well not the 3500 it would have to be the 3600 but mm -hmm. right now the 3600 is 750 that price will come down even further as the year goes on uh save your money keep your 300 dollars right now add some more to it it's gonna hit six hundred dollars at some point. The thirty six hundred, I don't know if it's gonna get all the way down to five hundred dollars like the thirty five hundred did, because it is a more advanced receiver. It, it does process eleven speakers instead of only seven. Uh, but it's gonna get down to six hundred. I'm very confident in that. And by the time that happens, you might have saved another three hundred dollars. Tough it out for a little bit, I say. Yeah. So for streaming, he's using an Amazon Fire uh, 4K Fire TV 4K stick, whatever. It has the has the apple tv app now mm -hmm. so he can rent apple movies but is he getting the same quality as he would from an av uh, i'm sorry from an apple tv 4k he feels like he wants an apple for tv 4k but is there actually any reason why he needs one he's <laughs> looking for any excuse dude you're saving money for a receiver so no mm. you may not have an apple no you may not i'm sorry really no. the only feature is the automatic frame rate switching that's yeah. something the Apple TV 4K does that Which the Fire you don't TV care about right now. <laughs> 4K stick isn't isn't doing it, but that's like it as far as like mm. the quality goes. Other than switching the frame rate automatically for you, there's there's really no other reason to do it. So I have to agree with Tom here. Uh, as but I like the Apple TV 4K a lot, but mm. uh, for that one one thing and one thing only, pretty hard to justify. <laughs> So which streaming rental services offer the best quality and or highest bit rates? Apple, Google, 
Google rent stuff? I didn't forget. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. The Google Play Store. I know. Yeah. 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 That still exists. Mm -hmm. Who knew? Voodoo, Amazon. Is there a way for him to easily see the incoming bit rates? I think it must be Apple. That it would be is. my guess. Yep. Yeah. Apple Apple are the ones. Their bit rates are uh, are higher than everybody else's. So that, that's about it. Plus, yep. if you're going to find it with uh, Atmos and HDR, it'll almost certainly be the Apple version. Yeah. There you go. Ted. Ted wants to try 24-bit 90... 96 kilohertz streaming music service. So he signed up for a trial of Cobuz. With, uh, it's Cobuz. Cobuz. Q O B U Z. Mm -hmm. People, stop it. Search Your engine stupid optimization. <laughs> Nobody Cobuz. else has something called Q O B U Z. Cobuz. But he doesn't have a CoBuzz app built into his Denon X4400H, and he never will. So he tried to use the CoBuzz app on his iPhone instead. But if he uses AirPlay, the audio quality is awful. It sounds like AM radio, so that can't possibly be right. Also, somehow his subwoofers aren't making any sounds at all, even though there's definitely he's definitely configured his setup to use them. And he's just in stereo listening modes, or so he thought. As it turned out, it was actually direct mode. But still, well, there, there's your subwoofer problem. That's the so subwoofer ideas, problem. Yeah. yeah what, what's going on? What's going on here? Uh, well, there's multiple things here. I, mean, I was going to say, because yeah. he's airplaying it, <laughs> he right? Is so airplay, airplay, it. airplay will decode everything into what it can and then <sighs> output it into 1644, right? 1648. They do, 48. They do 48. But it is, it is uh, going to be down sampling everything coming into 1648 at maximum. So that, that's right. airplay for one. You're not getting 24 bit 96 kilohertz, although that's not what's altering the sound. Um, on top of that, I know that Ted has room correction of some sort active, and that's right. limited to 48 kilohertz. So you actually could kind of would want to use the direct or the pure direct mode because that will deactivate your room correction because your room correction is limiting you to 48 kilohertz. Um, so you would have to, huh. Now, can you even get 2496 out of an iPhone with a cable? I'm not even sure if, I, I think don't. you can, but Would it I'm, be the headphone cable, I guess? Well, I mean, it'd, be, it'd be the lightning jack. I, yeah. I think you can, but I'm not 100% sure on that. I mean, on, on Android, you can certainly do it um, with a you know USB-C cable. So there's all of those things where it's going to be very difficult in this current setup that you've described, Ted, to even get 2496, first of all. But let's put that aside because, I mean, Tom and I will both tell you 2496. That's not the thing making any difference. Why would it sound like AM radio? No, I don't know. If, I think he's exaggerating a bit. But, um, I mean, we solved the subwoofer issue. Ted solved that for himself. Right. Uh, but why Like, why would it sound that bad? Now, I don't know if the trial actually delivers the full quality, although you would think they would want to because if they're trying to sell you on, right, hey, we right, stream right, higher right, quality right. music, they'd at least want to give you a taste of it. Um, they would. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It would be weird um, to limit it. Uh, it I, could, I, is, I wonder if this decoding that's happening, yeah. doing the airplay, I think, yeah. is because, I mean, is it, does it no, even have the, I mean, the phone certainly has the ability, but does the, I don't know the, the service, the the whatever you call AirPlay. Can it when it gets something that's been decoded from ninety six down to forty eight and everything uh -huh. else? I mean, is it handling it correctly? That would be my Th guess as to where what's that's happening. That's my guess of where this is happening. Because I mean, yeah. like if Cobas were sending you sixteen forty eight and that were just being straight decoded and sent over AirPlay, I mean, there's no reason why that should sound any different. Then, if yeah. you had a hardwired cable or something like that, so that I, I think it has to be somewhere in the whatever this Cobuzz app is doing, and then it's being downsampled and converted and fed out of AirPlay it is somewhere in that chain is where this is. If going you really want to do this test, you need to be using headphones and a computer. I mean, that's what you you know like an external well, I mean, you could do headphones yeah headphones directly to your iphone i yeah again i'm not even sure if it outputs 96 straight out of the iphone i'm not sure of that yeah, i don't know i think it that's why i said that's why i said computer yeah, so you yeah. know you know plug into your computer get the the song up in you know off a cd yeah and get the song off of this thing and then see which one you if you can hear a difference if you can it's because something the cute go buzz is doing something wrong all right steve Stephen and his wife are having a new house built, and they would like to have a space that is dedicated to being a home theater. 
They're building in, uh, in an area where basements are uncommon, so their current plans include a media room on the second floor. The dimensions in the current plan are 18 and a half wide by 19 and a half essentially long and eight feet high. But one wall is marked as a half wall with a couple of steps leading from the media room to a bonus room beside it. So it steps down. Not I think I I can't up. tell what direction these I mean it's only a couple of steps so this isn't like yeah, a it's whole like two or floor. three yeah. yeah okay so there's another basically he's not talking about the bonus room is how big though that's the real question it looks like sixteen by five something by it got it, yeah I got cut off in the image that he off. sent in but yeah likely around the same ish size I'm guessing yeah, yeah so I'm guessing that yeah okay so yeah it looks like there's a little cut in where the stairs are so mm -hmm. it'd be sixteen feet uh. The, uh, the the media room would be 18 feet wide, and this would be 16 feet wide, mm. only five feet deep, and again, nine feet tall. But I don't exactly know what's going on there exactly. Yeah, we're, really we're, we're but the point is, this media room, as planned at the moment, is not a fully enclosed rectangle. Right. Yeah. So, did I read everything there? Yeah. Okay. They are approaching the phase of planning where they will be laying out electrical, including lighting and any in wall and ceiling uh, speaker wiring. And he would like our suggestion on how to lay out his theater so he can nail down the locations of outlets, speaker placement, and projector mount. What do we think his seating layout should be? He's considering, considering two rows. Uh, two rows of three or four seats each and he was thinking he might also put some bar stools at the very back what do we think not enough room for three rows i don't see three rows in here Flat at all yeah. out, not enough room and Unless even the two rows is a little was... squishy but doable yeah so it, it so you could do it so that you are the 18 foot wall is on your left or right okay and then you know or you could do it so the 18 foot wall is your front screen. wall yeah mm. Those are the two options I would be looking at. So what are the differences here? Yeah. Uh, so you have to consider the entire space, not yes. just the media area. So yes. it, it, you, when you tell us the size of the, the room, you actually need to tell us the entire size of the, of the open space. Including the bonus room. Right, because it looks like there's doors enclosing both of these spaces. That's right. It I looks like you, you come in and you've got this bonus room and media room attached to each other, but they appear, I mean, from the little bit we can see in the image, those look like they can be closed off from the rest of the house. And that's okay. You know, yeah. uh, I mean, my first instinct, since he's building this place from the ground up, it sounds like, or at least it's a major renovation. If it's not full from the ground up, I'm like, can you just fully enclose that media room? That's my my first instinct. You know, instead of a half wall, can that be a full wall? But I'm certain. No, I don't hate. I don't hate the half wall, especially it's if not, the half it's wall not the end is. Of the world. Yeah. If, if if that if that if those steps are going up and not down, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think you know if you're thinking of the bar stools at the back of the room, you put bar stools right there at that half wall on and the you other build side, little, like yeah, in, on the, on other the side. bonus room side, not the yeah. media room. Yeah, and side. then you have mm -hmm. your screen on the 18 foot wall, and yeah. now you have you know, one or two rows in the room, the bar stools in the bonus room mm -hmm. and the bar, you know, have them swivel so that yeah. people can be facing inside the bonus room or yeah. they could be facing the screen. Yeah. You have options on both sides. And I would but, certainly, you know, if there's going to be one wall of my room that is open, I want it to be my back wall. Yeah, me too. You know, yeah. so so both of us are leaning towards uh, the solid 18 and a half foot wall that you've got. Or no, wait, that might be the 19 and a half foot wall because... In the diagram, it looks like this room is a little bit taller than it is wide, doesn't it? Isn't it 18 and a half from left to right and 19 and a half from top to bottom? No, it's 18. Oh, 19. Yeah, maybe. It's very strange. Whatever oh, it is, it's 19. Yeah. you have your own same diagram. The left wall of your diagram, the solid wall, the wall right. opposite the stairs, opposite the half wall. That's where, where go. we're going to yeah. say put your screen and your front speakers because, so I'm going to assume it's 18 and a half feet that you've now got from the front wall to the half wall. All right? Yes. Now, if you put your front row of seats, I'm going to say 11 feet from the screen, that gives you okay. six and a half feet. So your second row is going to be pushed right back against that half wall but that's okay yeah. because the top of that half wall is open you you don't actually have a strong reflection right behind the heads of that second row it's only a half wall back there yeah. so that's okay yeah if you want bar stools they're on the other side they're in the bonus room facing the half wall uh, i think that all works out pretty darn well that's as good as you can do in my opinion for rows of seating in here you could even do the thing since you're going to have the stairs on at the left side of that half wall now you could do three seats are along that half wall and then you have a four seater that's 11 feet from the from the screen 
Yeah, I like it. That's yeah. that would work. Uh, you have you'll have plenty of space on either side of your screen to That's put right. speakers and subwoofer. Yeah, uh, yeah. Because if this so room is I... nineteen and a half feet wide now, you can yeah. certainly fit in four seats and a nice big screen and speakers on either side. Totally. Yeah, I agree. Uh, where do we? Where should the electrical out wall outlets be placed? Well, by code, I think it's like every. Yeah. Three. So it's it, you'll have more than you need. I mean, I will. Just, they do it by code. I will just say that because this isn't always the case. If you just have an electrician come in and they put it down, you know, every whatever span of feet it is by code, they don't necessarily always put outlets close to the corners. Uh, I think it's always helpful in a theater to have outlets. I mean, not like in the corner, but close right. to all the corners, because if you want to put, yeah. yeah, for subwoofers, and you might be moving subs around in here potentially uh, to I figure would out also, what are the best corners. I would also put a outlet smack dab at, in the middle of the room yep. by the 11 foot yep. space. Because if you get those powered recliners, you're going to want to plug something you know, ah, yes. plug them in. Absolutely right. And that'll make your life a lot easier if yep. you do that. So I, I would put them there. Yep. Uh, where should his, his optimal project, projector mount location on the ceiling? Optimal, I mean, it, it, you know, obviously throw distance is going to vary from, mm -hmm. from projector to projector. But mm -hmm. I think, you know, if you have it, you know, what, about 15 feet back around there? Yeah, I mean, I'm it, thinking... It would be pretty good, pretty uh, safe. Yeah, again, if you have that first row at 11 feet... And the second row right against the half wall, so 18, 18 and a half feet back. If you sort of have the projector in between the two rows, yeah, um, yeah right around 14, 15 feet is pretty darn safe. I mean, I think you're going to be going for probably a 120-inch screen. That's what I would recommend to you with those seating distances right, is a 120-inch right. screen. Um, if you have the projector with its lens, and let's refer to the lens. So remember, there's the body of the projector behind the lens. If you have the projector with its lens any closer than about 13 feet, you're you're asking it to open right up to its widest possible angle, and you might not be able to hit a full 120 inches on like the Epsons and the JVCs that are typically our right. favorites. So you're probably going to end up with an Epson if you go with our suggestions in the future. Um, right. So... Try to have the lens at about, I think, 14 feet, and then the body's going to be behind there, taking that to about 15, and then the seats are the rear row of seats is just behind that. I think that's pretty optimal. Yeah. Uh, he didn't ask us where to put speakers or speaker wire, which I think is concerning. Well, I think, I think he... once you figured out the layouts of here's where my seats go, here's where my screen goes, right. then the speakers go where Dolby tells you to put the speakers. Yeah. So yeah. if you have any questions about that, let us know. Right. Tim. Tim has noticed that many projector screens are now being marketed as 4K screens, or they have 4K in their model name somewhere. If you're buying a 4K projector, is it necessary to have a 4K projection screen? If a projection screen doesn't say it's 4K, will it somehow harm the image? Uh, so it's all, I mean, it, it, to me, it's more about how close you sit to it and what the, so you're worried about like whatever texture is right. on the screen so that, you know, it, these itty bitty pixels aren't being, you know, somehow warped by the, the texture that's up there. If you sit far enough away, you're probably not going to notice it. 4K screens, if they say they're 4K, are usually the same as they were last year, except now they say yes. 4K. There's very, I mean, there's very little difference. Uh, especially we you. if you go with a standard white screen like so yeah. i mean like we talked about a couple questions ago we're going to tell you on this podcast you either go with a standard white screen or you go with a full on ambient light rejecting screen or of course the one where this might apply is acoustically transparent all right if it's right, a standard that's what I was thinking, if yeah. it's a standard yeah. white screen we want you to get one that essentially has no or exceedingly little texture to begin with, in which case it doesn't need to be marketed as 4K. It's already a basically textureless white field. So that's done. The ambient light rejecting screens, I mean, I don't think you can find one that doesn't market itself at 4K at this point. So it's kind of neither here nor there. You're going to end up with it regardless. The acoustically transparent is where this can potentially make a small difference because it is a, a weave. It's an actual weave. If you get right up close to it or look at it with a magnifying glass, you will see that it is a woven fabric. And so those ones, you know, the, the how far apart the little holes are in that weave can make somewhat of a little bit of a difference. So if that's mm -hmm. what you're looking at, um, again, like Tom just said, though, it's how far are you sitting from that screen? Because you will not notice it if you are far away. Um, yeah. So if you're like 10 feet and or sometimes closer. you will not notice it if you're just not looking for it. You know, I've, I've been in plenty of theaters where people have gotten the 
the acoustically transparent mm -hmm. uh, weaved ones that we don't recommend. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. And what was it Elite was the one that we were having yeah, issues with? Elite for sure, because there they have their Acoustic Pro uh, 1080, which mm -hmm. like despite the 1080, that's not the reason. I don't, yeah. I'm not a big fan of that screen material full stop i want you to get the one that they call uhd ultra hd or could be called 4k but that not because it's called uhd but because i just think it's a better material full stop yeah right but i've been in theaters where uh people are quote unquote video files and yeah. they care more about the video or at least as much about the video as they do about the audio and uh, they've got this screen up there and it's huge and you're sitting what you and I, Rob and Tom, would say is too close for that weave to mm. be so that people would be noticed. And they never, they're like, oh, my God, this is the best screen we've ever had. Sure. So, you know, we're being exceedingly, as we are in all things, only because we want you to be happy. We're yep. overly cautious. And we will warn you if we think you're you're going down a path that... Uh, that is, you know, uh, that that may give you issues, but right. is is the cheapest path. And then, in which case, we'll say you can do this. These are some of the potential pitfalls you might run into. But if there's two things that are essentially the same price or close enough to the same price, mm -hmm. we're going to always tell you go with the one that we know will not send you back to this podcast right. angry. <laughs> but like maybe Tim is just looking at Silver Ticket. Silver Ticket doesn't put 4K in the name yeah. of their white screens. I'm like, that's no problem, Tim. <laughs> their no standard problem. white screen, a okay. <laughs> So if you have an Ultra HD Blu-ray player with 7.1 analog outputs, mm -hmm. you do? Really? Yeah, <laughs> kind of, still makes it. They, they, they exist, but they're pretty un uncommon. <laughs> and you use those analog outputs to feed an Atmos receiver. Will the Atmos receiver do that multi-channel analog signal? Will it still play? What will it do with that analog channel? Will it still play Atmos DTS-X? Will it apply Dolby Surround or DT, uh, DTS Neural X upmixing? Will it say that it's receiving multi-channel PCM? It should say it's receiving multi-channel PCM. Mm -mm. No, and not analog. Yeah. What's not that? analog. Oh, it's not? This is the 7.1 analog outputs, uh, man. No. So what's uh, it going to do? No to all of those. Uh, so well, It's definitely not going to do in the upmixing, for sure. No, no, no. But. Yeah, because the... the Analog inputs on AV receivers, I mean, maybe there's one out there that does converting the analog input to digital so that it can apply its digital processing to it, but I'm not aware of it. All the ones that I know that have 7.1 analog inputs, I'm talking about the AV receivers here, they just take that analog signal and they might apply some like trim to it, you know, volume to volume it. Volume control, yeah. But then they just send it to the amplifiers. Because... It, it, that, bypass, that bypasses Odyssey and everything. But I thought it, it would still Odyssey. read multi-channel in. It doesn't read multi-channel Because multi multi-channel PCM would have to be a digital signal. Oh, PCM is pulse code yeah. modulation. It's right, a digital right, 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 signal. Right, right. It would just say, I mean, it all it would say on the front is whatever the name of that 7.1 analog in is. Right. I, I don't know right. how that's labeled on your particular AV receiver. It's, some of them use different names, but it would just be the 7.1 analog input it's not doing up mixing. It's not doing room correction. It's not doing bass management. It's just altering the volume for you and sending it to the amplifiers. That's it. So in those cases, when you're, if you decide to use that, which I we, we don't, I don't recommend. Know. Why? Why? Why would you do that? Because maybe you've got the world's oldest receiver. I don't know, but, but then uh, it's not an you, Atmos receiver. <laughs> yeah, you would uh, you would want to make sure that the speaker settings in your uh, player uh -huh. are also correct. Yeah, so all that, the bass management would have to be done in the player. If not, you're not going to. All you're going to get out of the subwoofer channel is the L, is the uh, yeah LFE the, the LFX yeah LFE yeah LFX whatever don't whatever. I just don't I just don't do that. I I maybe he was taken by some of the marketing, you know, claiming like this this has a fantastic analog audio section. I'm like, dude. No, not, no, 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 no. D digital, out, HDMI out of your Ultra HD Blu-ray player. Please, HDMI out for all the audio. Michael, Michael has a 65-inch Samsung JS8500 uh, SUHD TV from 2015. SU, mm -hmm. super... Ultra HD, whatever. Samsung the, Ultra HD. The, the SUHD models were the precursors to today's QLEDs, and back when Samsung was still calling qu uh, quantum dots uh, nano crystals. That's right. They didn't think people would cotton to quantum dots. They were wrong. Everybody loves the word quantum now. 
That's right. The JS8500 is edge lit, but the lights are placed uh, on the left and right sides of the TV as HDMI 2.0 inputs and HDCP 2.2, and it can accept HDR10 signals. Mm -hmm. So with the Panasonic UB4020 Ultra HD Blu-ray player, what are the correct output settings? And I, I'm pretty sure he's talking about the uh, HDR optimizer. Because, I mean, right. auto for your resolution, 24 frames per second, yeah. all of that is totally fine. Um, yeah. Leave it at uh, Y. I think they label theirs YUV or YCBCR. It's going to be one of those two. Leave it at that. Don't convert things to RGB in the player. Uh, but the HDR optimizer, what type of display should you tell your Panasonic UB420 that you have? The JS8500, thankfully, uh, R-Ting's uh, review of it is still up there. And they tell you how bright this thing can get. And it can get to about 500 nits. Uh, which is one of the options. Uh, that is your basic luminance LCD is the name in the HDR optimizer that Panasonic would give it. The It's the lowest one. It's the lowest one. That's 500 nits. And that'll work nicely because the JS8500 was one of those ones where, yeah, it could take an HDR's 10 signal. Didn't really know what to do with it, uh, <laughs> but it could take it. So if all of the processing has been done in the player beforehand, so much the better. Uh, there really wasn't any tone mapping going on in those mm. models back then yeah. they didn't yeah, yeah. know what was going on with hdr yet <laughs> but yeah no that, that that good question and that should work basic luminance lcd all right you and the five other people that still own that tv or it, it, man, why should people be them. it's only that's only five years not even I know. five years ago not even five why years should ago. that be an old tv at this point i know i know <laughs> i know it's just hard when you buy a tv when a new technology just comes out yeah you know, and you kind of end up with TVs that are, not, I wouldn't say half-baked, but they shoehorn as much as they could at the time yep. into them. And yes. then now you're kind of yeah, my, dealing my with the aftermath. Yeah, my first 4K TV that didn't have HDCP 2.2. So it can't take any 4K signals without a HDCP converter. <laughs> yeah, I have a, a, all right, one of my first 1080p displays with a Westinghouse. Mm. And, and every, those were famous for being one of the earliest HD TVs, you know, widescreens that you could get that were so very, very inexpensive expensive but they literally did nothing and, mm. and it was almost impossible to get them cali uh, color calibrated correctly it was were those you know, the ones but, that could only take 720p and 1080i when 1080p came out they couldn't even accept it because i don't was remember like, if i had one of those there was a I couple had, of those in the early days those, yeah yep. yeah i don't think i had one of those i think i had it could take a full 1080p if i remember okay. correctly but i might be wrong Jefferson. Jefferson just moved into a into a new house in his old place. He had an Atmos set up with in-ceiling speakers, but he left those in-ceiling speakers behind, and now he's in need of a, of new ones for his new house. He's using a Marantz uh, AV7702 Mark II Pre-Pro connected to uh, Bryston and Emotiva amplifiers. He has four SVS SB13 Ultra subs for his new 13 by 20 by 8 foot room. That you should, should be, be able to pressurize that with those. <laughs> nice. With seven floor level speakers are all Atlantic technology, he'd like to get back to a full 7.4.4 configuration. So he's already got four subs. He's already got seven floor level speakers. He mm -hmm. just needs overhead. Yep. He's hoping to keep the, keep the price around 500 bucks for four new in-ceiling speakers, but he wants them to blend as nicely as possible with the rest of his setup. What do we suggest? Uh, Atlantic Tech. Boy, I haven't thought about that company in a yeah, while. Yeah, I mean, those were the Vance Dickinson. Yeah, designs. they should those, be. They have a super those. wide dispersion. Uh, they, they should be you know relatively flat they should play nice with just about anything to be honest they really them. should yeah i mean uh, they played particularly well back when emotiva was making uh their dome tweeter speakers because same speaker designer they worked right. real well back then but that's not what emotiva does anymore um yeah so i mean again my go-to here is going to be a Perian, although right we're a little bit over your price range because they're 150 each um right. so we've gone 100 bucks over you what you were looking to pay there but i'd like immediately, that's where I would point you. Either them or RBH, but typically, unless you become an RBH dealer, the RBHs are going to be a little bit more expensive. Yeah. Um, so it doesn't really help you out there. I, I mean, I you can go with the mono price, whatever that mono price offering we sometimes talk about. Yeah, the Sycamores. Okay. I, if you really, I, I, can you save a hundred bucks? Because I think the appearance would probably be your best bet as well. Yeah, I mean, like I like the Sycamores a lot for Atmos. I think they're entirely sufficient for just about anybody's system. But looking at all the rest of what Jefferson has, I'm like, that's that's higher end, higher end stuff. And yeah. if it's at all questionable, I'm like, the Aperians are right there. I, I think that's where I really want to point you, Jefferson. All right. Daniel, 
Recent price drops have resulted in the LG B9 OLED being noticeably less expensive than the C9 model, and both are now uh, less expensive than Samsung's Q90 flagship 4K QLED model. Is the C9 worth the extra money over the B9? What are the differences? Haven't we answered this question recently? And how does the Q90 stack up? Is there any any reason to actually pay more for it? Yeah, I, I don't like... I don't mind answering again because things are, I mean, not yeah. exactly changed, but clarified at this point. Because yeah. um, so the B9 and the C9, man, it's really hard to justify a C9. So, I mean, there's the obvious, the cosmetic differences on the outside. Right, right. The C9 has better speakers. Okay, I doubt you're even using the built-in speakers, but I mean, those could be legitimate reasons for somebody. Um, so, I mean, the obvious one is they will tell you the C9 has the Alpha 9 Generation 2 processor, the B9 has the Alpha 7 Generation 2 processor. What does that actually mean, if anything? About the only place you might notice it, two things. If you turn on the AI something, whatever the, the, the AI thing that attempts to analyze the picture and, like, sharpen it up and, you know, boost the contrast and things like that, I would always tell you to turn that off anyway but that is one area where the extra processing has a little bit more ability in the C9 versus the B9. But I'm going to tell you to tell, turn it off anyway, so I'm not worried about that. The other one is the smooth gradation feature, all right? You're watching Amazon Prime Video, which almost always has a ton of color banding in it. The C9 does a better job of smoothing out those color bands in a source like that. Again, the, in, uh, the little bit more powerful processing seems to have a small advantage there. That's about it. Uh, the other advantages, there are genuine advantages between the C9 and the B9, but it's all for professional calibrators. Uh, the C9 has a bigger lookup table. Uh, the C9 can do the um, auto cal with uh, mm. Calman. So it, it's all on the professional calibration side. So if you're not going to use any of those things and you're fine with the smooth gradation being good, but not the very best, but when would you ever notice that without a side-by-side... I'm like, you save a few hundred bucks, you get a B the nine, you get the B nine. It's uh because uh, the, the other feature that we thought was gonna be different was we thought the C9s were gonna be able to do G Sync and the B9s weren't. But it turns out they got G Sync working on the B9, so that's not even a difference anymore. Mm. Uh the Q90, why would you get a Q I mean, if you're super worried about burn in, but like, man, like everybody's coming around to the today's oh, the newest oleds as long as you don't crank the oled light setting mm -hmm. um if you keep the oled light setting at 40 or below like nobody's getting burned in anymore it just like unless you really just leave one channel logo there all the time right so it's I, i'd get an oled man so new it's a brave new world <laughs> we finally can recommend the oleds over <laughs> LCDs for price I mean yeah. so Dan well, yeah. Yeah. a few episodes ago we compared the BenQ HT 3550 projector versus Epson Home Cinema 4010 but what about the Epson Home Cinema 3800 the HT 3550 and the Home Cinema 3800 are the exact same price right now which, so which of the two is better you know, these mm. projector questions I'm going to tell you ugh. Okay, what are the? Let's do pros and cons. The thirty-five fifty is a tiny bit sharper. Um, it's DLP. It's the ten eighty p DLP chip that's being shifted four times per frame. Okay. Uh, the Epson thirty eight hundred is a ten eighty p panel that's being shifted two times per frame. So there are twice as many pixels being flashed to your eye every frame by the 3550 but more than that it's that it's the dlp the dlp is what gives it the little bit of edge in just sheer sharpness of how razor tack sharp does the image look it's a little bit of an advantage there almost everywhere else the home cinema 3800 i think is is it's it's brighter for hdr the 3800 i'm just gonna say flat out looks better um, the 3550, it does HDR, but it, it's not a huge difference over SDR. It just doesn't have the oomph to get you there. The 3800 is practically a light cannon, and HDR looks different, uh, and it looks better. So their um, black levels are similar. Both of them can take 4K HDR signals at 60 frames per second, and the 3800 has lower latency. So if you're a gamer, the 3800 is definitely the better choice. Both of them are entirely manual lenses. Uh, there's no motorized lens on either of them, but the 3800 has larger zoom range and more lens shift. Both of them have those things, but the Epson 3800 has more. 
So 3,800 is where I lean. Uh, yeah, that's it. All right. Josh. Josh is back after we discussed his basement uh, that he wants to finish. The one with the stairway that comes down the middle. And then to the left uh, is the area that he'd like to turn into a theater. The right is where the office goes along with the washroom and utility room. I do remember this. Mm -hmm. He made some mock-ups of the orientation options, but they are not to scale. As a reminder, he already owns a 14-foot wide couch that he prefer to keep using. And once the room is finished, he expects the dimensions to be around 14 and a half from the stairs to the side and 18 in the other dimension. So the room... Ha, he had he has on either side of his couch uh, in the drawings is not accurate there will be less and me, how much space there is yeah uh, because it's a 14 because right now he's got the 14 foot wide couch going yeah, across 14 the and 14 and a half, half foot, foot, yeah so that's with like some six space inches. on either side it's like no there'd be no, no space. there's not yeah you, you cannot get behind the couch once you yeah. put the couch in there you're gonna wedge that bad boy in there that's what be about it <laughs> so he's got it facing the 14 foot orientation uh, mm -hmm. uh the couch that way and then facing forward so that you'd come down the stairs and to the left you would see the screen on the front wall in front of you mm -hmm. and behind you would be the couch shoved into that space where you could not get behind <laughs> it no matter what mm -hmm. which is not a bad thing because behind him he's got his speakers his projector and his av rack yep. so to get to the av rack you have to jump over the couch mm. climb over the back of the couch to get to your av rack it keeps kids away from it so there's that so <laughs> you know something to consider the other orientation he has is when you come down the stairs uh, to, to the left, uh, as you, you landed to your left, it would be the back of the couch or the back half mm -hmm. of the couch. And on that wall, uh, you know, to the left of you, not in front of you and to the left, but to the left of you would be the screen. Mm -hmm. And then his his couch would be right on that wall right there, which is what I said last week I thought would be the orientation that made the most because sense Because he was talking about things being like, this is also a hangout room. It's not yeah. just... A purely dedicated theater. It's like a hangout room for his teenage daughter and all her friends. And we're like, more room, more open. You know, the the, the first orientation looks more like a theater, but it yes. doesn't give you as much room to just hang out. The wider orientation with the couch hanging halfway into the opening beside the stairs gives you more room to just hang out. And Depends on what you mean by hangout, too. I mean, you could, if at the, as you come down the stairs and directly in front of you to your right-ish, uh, mm -hmm. that area becomes the hangout area, then the back True. of the couch being to your left, it sort of delineates that. Uh, and then if not, then the other orientation, uh, which is the, the more home theater orientation where you when you come down the stairs and the screen is directly there, it yeah. opens up that entire space sort of as part of the home theater, even if you yeah, do to the to the right else. of the home theater, basically. I, I am That's... honestly okay with either of these orientations. I'm sure there's going to be a question well, involved. There was here. one more though that I thought of that he didn't draw up, which what if we took the home theater looking orientation with uh, with and that flipped but it 180. turned it 180 degrees, so the screen is now on the bottom wall. So you come down the stairs and you would see the couch facing you, right. basically. But I mean. You got a whole wide open area now. It's not going to be difficult to walk around the couch with that. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, even, you know, even with the couch off the front wall. But he was also talking about he might like to have more seating than just the couch. So the couch is there on the back wall. It's a big old hangout area. You got a couple of recliners or something in front of that couch that are closer to the screen for when it's like just you and your wife actually sitting down to watch a movie and you want to be closer to the screen or something. So flipping that whole thing 180 degrees, I'm almost leaving that. I mean acoustically for your front speakers i'd rather have you know walls to the left and right not have one side open if mm -hmm. if we're talking about that now that still works in the wider orientation you still have side walls for your front speakers there but right yeah i, I almost like the flip at 180 degrees i think all of these things could work you know <laughs> they it, all could it really work, doesn't yes, matter yeah, yeah, none, yeah none of them really are bad as far as i'm concerned the idea of putting the couch on the the idea of putting the the screen kind of tucked into that little out it's not little i mean it's no, still like 14, 14 and a half feet wide. wide yeah but uh having it tucked back there means that you know you're now limiting how wide a little bit more how wide you can put your speakers and some yes. of the other things yes. that you, it, it you know, I would definitely go for a small. If I did that, I would go for a smaller screen, and with the focal point of the you know, the the viewing angle would be the two recliners or maybe the love yeah. seat that's in front of the yeah. couch being the primary row of seats, yeah, and that back couch being the hangout couch where yeah. people sit back there and Instagram the entire time, uh, and then everything is focused on that those other two rows. That that way, you're that other row, that front row, so that you can mm -hmm. get the screen a little bit smaller. You have side, you know, space on the sides for your subwoofer and your, um, or if you have, if that's where you end up putting your subwoofer and your, 
uh, uh, speakers, you know, there's there's a lot of things to consider in that. It, that I'm just thinking takes that takes a little it, bit know, more planning the, with the current more narrow orientation. Like the what's behind that couch really is unusable space as far as people goes. Yeah, you know, and I'm like, I, yeah. I don't know if that's the best use of this space. Whereas if you flip it around 180 degrees, it opens everything up. Yeah. So he seems to have foregone the idea of two permanent rows of seats. He really didn't want to deal with this riser anyways. And he proclaims that he is more of an audio guy. So while making the setup wider than this long, the second picture uh, gives uh, everything a more open feeling. It would make it e really easy to add more seats, whether temporarily or permanently. He could really only have a 5.2 for the floor level speakers, and he would only have four overheads, two of which would be directly above his seats. On the other hand, if he makes the room longer than this wide, which is the orientation that Rob says should be flipped 180 degrees, mm -hmm. he could do 7.2.6 configuration. <laughs> you could. And he can't get it out of his mind that for Atmos having surround back and rear height speakers seems important. So now that we have better visuals, what do we think? Also, should he consider the wider than long 5.2.4 setup, but with addition of front wides? No. Just fr <laughs> Can everybody get off the front wide train? <laughs> I have I Jesus. have poisoned this pool of listeners it is, with it, my it, talk of front wides. Front wides are a non-thing, okay? Oh. No, They are a non thing they don't oh, they it exist pains me, Tom. in the how, in how the niches of thing? niches stop can we all remind ourselves that rob still likes 3d can we just I every do. time we talk about front uh, rob and front mm -hmm. wides remember this is a man who's having front wides and 3d so it's you gotta true. take you gotta take you know what he likes with a little bit of a grain of salt i love he when is, some people are like you know you, you guys don't talk about like the, like the you know the really esoteric and like the really high and i'm like I have a tiny 11 foot by 12 foot den with 11 speakers, two PC 13 ultras, and I still watch 3D and I have front wide speakers. Like I am one of the most ridiculous people. So yeah. nobody ever say that I don't enjoy the esoteric ridiculous stuff. <laughs> so, okay, as far as, and I've already forgotten his question. First of all, 7.2.6, you're not getting that. Stop talking about it. It's not <laughs> happening, okay? It's not I mean, happening. Uh, that's an X8500. That's what's going yeah. on there. I mean, yeah. I guess that's why he's thinking he could do six overheads or potentially add front wides. He's going to, if he gets an X8500. I will also tell you that if you're going to be doing a, the, the, the wide version where your couch is right to the, you know, is your, your, you're, you open the whole room up. The couch mm -hmm. you're seeing the back of the couch as you come down the stairs, and the, the left wall is your screen. Uh, seven. First of all, five point two point four is doable and oh, fine. Yeah. The way you have the speakers kind of located, the 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 top middles need to be like almost on that. Well, back I mean that wall. that couch could be scooched forward a little bit. It doesn't have to be yeah. pushed right back against. Yeah, the, he's the gonna hack. He, I think he's gonna actually push it against that back wall. But could be. and the. Which means you're going to have front heights. You can't have top middles and top fronts. Correct. That, that is not a thing. So you're going to have yeah. front heights, which means they're going to be on that front wall. Well, they don't have okay. to be on the front. You, you can put but them in the ceiling, but just to. label them as front heights. That's yeah, totally yeah, front fine. Front heights. Uh, I and if you end up doing the 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 other orientation that Rob was talking about, mm -hmm. I still think five points. I think the reason he didn't he didn't put it in the orientation you suggested is because there's no way to put the surround left speaker without having it in the room ah, or on a ceiling. Correct. That is, so that is true. That is true. I think that's why he did that. But mm. if you, mm. you know, you could kind of cheat it a little bit, uh, you know, have it on that little, ha that little wall next to the stairs. I don't know what that looks like. It could just be a half wall, which means it wouldn't work. I don't know. But uh, I d would still do 5.2.4. I, w I don't think I would have the seven, the back surround back speakers. You're only a couple of feet off that back wall. Yeah. And that seven, the, the seven, the, the surround backs and the top, I think the top rears are going to be too close together. I would still do 5.2.4 in that orientation. I, I know you want to put all the speakers in here. I yeah. know you do. Yeah. Okay. But I will tell you from experience that when even when you're sitting and you got the speakers too close to each other, they don't, they absolutely hurt. Mm the immersion mm -hmm. and the sound they do not help they hurt so don't do it <laughs> <laughs> um yeah where do i fall down to this so i mean if i'm if i'm sticking with my idea of you yeah so you're right uh the where is that uh what would end up being your left side surround speaker although if the focus now is going to be a front row then 
we can probably work out something where maybe it even still it goes all depends on that, on wall what that left stairs. wall is if that yeah, stairs yeah, if, that, yeah, yeah. if that if that's like a if that's not like a wall with stairs yeah. behind it but it's like the the yeah. railing and it's right. open it, you might not have an option over there true so. true true but uh but i mean it could be a tower speaker it could be a speaker on a stand it could be something angled down from the ceiling prime elevation speaker that's mounted on the ceiling but angled at you as your as your side surround there are ways to come at it if we do the flipped 180 uh thing like that again i just all that unused space behind the couch doesn't make sense to me with the with the current front to wide so um start with 5.2.4 start with that that that's where i will come down on it yeah yeah nick so last year uh lg's 88 inch 8k oled and uh, it's called the Z9 or the Z9 if you're in Canada. Mm -hmm. Went on sale for 30 grand. At this year at CES, they introduced the follow up 88 inch 8K ZX. Oh, no. No, no, no. It is Z10. <laughs> <laughs> they went from 9 to 10, but they turned it into a Roman numeral. They don't want you to call it X. It's very important to LG. LG can suck it. It's a, <laughs> L, it's a ZX. Any yeah. guesses as to what its price will be? Any chance it will get the, uh, a brick? big price drop the way the second generations of 77 inch oleds did it's going to be 30 grand I, I i don't see any reason why it wouldn't be 30 grand yeah. it's like the only one on the market why would they it's <laughs> would not they only that i prices? mean they they barely made any z9s uh i mean it, te it technically went on sale but there were barely any of them and the plant that they were hoping to get up and running this year in uh, South Korea, which was going to be the one making the big OLED panels. Uh, it's been delayed. It's it's not going to be opening this year. So that the odds of a price drop happening on the 88 inch model is slim to none. It's going to remain at 30 grand is my prediction. Nick do not count on a price drop this year. 29, nine, nine, nine. Yes. That's my oh, yes. prediction. That's right. JR. JR moved to a new place. He used to have uh, his 65 inch 1080p edge lit Samsung LCD in the living room with lots of light. Now he has a basement. He's discovered that his edge lit LCD really bothers him. He heard a rumor about something called black, but he's never seen it. <laughs> At least you're colorblind, man. Good job. No racism. Anyways, he is a heavy gamer, and what he does most, in, and that's what he does most in this new basement theater. Music listening comes second, and movies third. TV shows are way down on the list. Mm. He's seen OLED TVs. He's blown away by them, and he wants one. But, of course, he's a bit worried about the burn-in. Then again, there are plenty of games saying they use OLED TVs, gamers at least, that say they use OLEDs all the time. So he has it gotten good enough that burn-in from gaming is less of a concern? Are there techniques or best practices that reduce the risk to a minimum? Yeah, anything that has a... Uh, a head a heads-up display a mm. hood anything like that uh that's static and most games do mm -hmm. uh, you need to worry you, i would worry about that i would not be you know playing a game that's ultra dark and the way that you you cheat i guess i don't want to call it cheating but the way that you combat that ultra darkness is you crank the brightness so that you can see that's in the darkness. one of the major things yeah uh you know i know that the plenty of gamers do that uh, i would be concerned about doing that with an oled uh, and, you know, switching games on the regular, you know, not doing what a lot of gamers do, which is I'm in the middle of something. I don't want to, I, I, I can't, <laughs> I can't stop, but I can't save and quit and come back to it. So I'll pause and I'll go have lunch and come back, you know, an hour or two later. That's the sort of things that's going to get you in trouble. I mean, one of the major things is keeping the OLED light setting turned down 40 or lower is definitely the safest. And now that you have a basement that you can dedicate and you can dim the lights. You can have light control. You don't need to crank the OLED light setting because you're not overcoming sunlight coming into your basement room. Um, right. So, so you should be able to do, you know, gaming in the dark, basically, or at least in dim lighting rather than, you know, full room lighting or sunlight. So that's going to help turn on all the protection features, you know, the little pixel orbiter that moves, shifts it around a little bit. Um, make sure that you, you know, power off and don't unplug your TV right away. Let it run its panel refresh thing that it does every four hours um, and turn on like the, uh, the channel bug um, uh, detector thing, the thing that's there for your news bugs and will dim the screen. If something is static all the time, if nothing else, it'll be a reminder to you. Oh, 
I've had this static thing on my screen for a long time. That's why my screen is dimming. I should change things up a bit. Um, you know, best practices are thankfully these days in a lot of games that do have a HUD, they give you some options for that HUD. They allow you to make it partially transparent, you know, translucent, or they allow you to have it turn off and only come in when you actually need to see something. Like if your game allows you to make those types of settings, make right. use of them. Right. You know, don't have a bright, static, solid HUD on your screen all the time. Uh, like I say, the, the the newest ones, the 2019s and the 2020s that are going to be coming out, they seem to have improved things on the burn-in front. That OLED light setting is the main thing. And uh, yeah, yeah, I mean... I, you just got to really resist the temptation when you're playing a dark game to crank the brightness. So yeah, crank see that better. OLED light. Don't, don't yeah. do that. I mean, cr cranking the actual black level the thing called brightness i right. mean that's just in the signal that's okay to do just don't crank the actual light output the thing they call oled light uh mm -hmm. don't don't turn that way up yeah so do the 2019 lg oled model support hdmi 2.1 or does he have to wait for 2020 uh no the 2019s do support it the one thing is the 2020 models are going to also support amd's free sync which the 2019s don't. The 2019s do the HDMI 2.1 version of variable refresh rate, which we don't have any sources that do that right now, <laughs> except for the, well, the Xbox One X kind of does it, but only up to 60 hertz, mm. which isn't what, like people like, I want it to go up to 120. That's kind of the whole point. So there's limitations there, but the, you know, Series X and PlayStation 5, they'll, they'll do the HDMI 2.1 version of variable refresh rate all the way up to 120. Uh, so the 2019s can already do that. They can already do G-Sync, NVIDIA G-Sync, but if you're using an AMD on a PC, because maybe he's a PC gamer, I'm not sure, if you're using AMD and you want free sync for that, you will need a 2020. So Samsung still seems to be the top alternative. Do they support HDMI 2.1 and have uh, and have the crappy off-axis viewing angles gotten any better? <laughs> uh, so full HDMI 2.1, no. Uh, only their 8K models have full HDMI 2.1 inputs. Uh, their 4Ks do not, but their 4Ks do support variable refresh rate, including FreeSync, but not G-Sync. So if you're a PC gamer with a G-Sync um, graphics card, you'd actually be much better with the OLED and you could grab a 2019 right now and it'll work with G-Sync. Um, yeah, well, but they'll work with FreeSync. The off-axis viewing angles too is something that, you know, I, I've only they really had... tried. What's that? <laughs> They've tried. Yeah. You know, the, the Q80 and the Q90 got the filter, the wide angle viewing filter. Uh, to try and make the wider viewing angles better, but I hate it because it made the black levels worse. Right. I I just you know, it's it's especially from a gamer perspective. If I mean, I, I, he's all he's worried, all he's talks about being worried about is games. Ninety percent of what he's doing down there yeah. is games and a yeah. little bit of other stuff. You're not sitting off axis, are you? <laughs> you know, but maybe so. he maybe he has local you know people come over and they play, and somebody's sitting off axis. You might yeah, be considering how, that. I mean, a, 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 Q, a Q90 is your best alternative to an OLED. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, because it's got so many local dimming zones that having that wide angle filter where it, it hurt the black levels a bit, it doesn't hurt the Q90 very much because the local dimming sort of takes over and compensates for that. Um, you know, it does do full variable refresh rate uh, for FreeSync as well, which is like, that's what your Xbox uses right now. You can do the FreeSync version of it too. So, because it's all AMD based. So, um, yeah, I mean, that's the best alternative. But I mean, uh, Professional gamers are using OLEDs now, and they're gaming nonstop. Yeah, like they may have burn-in though. We won't know. They'll that's true. <laughs> if they're if they're playing, you know, Binding of Isaac seventeen hours a day, and, right? Right. Yeah, you know, and they have the bright the the backlight turned all the way up for when they yeah. get Curse of Darkness or whatever yeah, it is that yeah. makes everything dark. Is and I know all the gamers do it. Uh, I just I can't imagine they don't have burn-in, but whatever. <laughs> So over on the audio front, he uses Moran, uh, Mirage OM9 Omnipolar speakers. These are ones that fire in all directions. Mm -hmm. uh, at least that should by that the well, name. They actually fire up and then like go into a little cone thing. Cone that thing disperses the sound in 360 degrees. Yeah. So he bought bass traps and a ceiling cloud from Sound Assure. I don't know what a cloud is. Is it something that goes on the ceiling? I guess. I mean, it's basically just absorption panels on your ceiling uh, okay. that hang down a little bit. So they call it a cloud. 
Yeah. And adding these, those did seem to improve his base. It sounds tighter, but uh, Sounds Assured also recommended to him that he place some absorption panels on his front wall behind his Mirage, Mirage Towers. Given the omnipolar design, is that a good idea? JR has his doubts. Now, you're not going to like what I say next. Okay. So, you know, sit down, I guess, yeah. or grab your seat or whatever. Strap in. But, uh, yeah, omnipolar and bipolar and all those polar anything other than just firing straightforward designs are ones I never recommend. I don't like them. <laughs> I think they're terrible. Uh, I don't know what they're trying to combat because all they're doing is making things, in my opinion, worse. Now, you have these speakers. You like these speakers. You love these speakers. These pe speakers have been good to you. That's great. Uh, yeah, absorbing everything other than what's coming directly at you is a good idea. <laughs> you know, it'll, you, it'll change the sound, and if you have room correction, you're going to need to rerun it. Yeah. There's no question about that. I, I would I be honest. If be I had agreement. omnipolar designs, I would put a, uh, I would I'd build a cube like a a, a a box that would go over the entire speaker, <laughs> and then take that was made out of absorption, and then take the front panel off, and then that's how I would. Yeah, you absorb. just, you just I would have absorb. a gobo built around it. Yeah, I would absorb open. the top, sides, mm -hmm. and back. That's what I would want to do with these things. <laughs> Which defeats the entire purpose, but I've never kind understood it, my whole uh, audio life. I've experienced lots of speakers that are uh, that are, have this type of design and stuff like, that, and they keep telling me how more open it sounds and everything. I'm like, it doesn't. It doesn't <laughs> sound more open to me now. Any experience I have of more openness is almost always due to the fact that somebody right beforehand said, "Doesn't it sound open to you?" I'm like, I guess i mean i don't really think that it sounds that much more open than anything else but this so the whole, whole idea that having it go in 300 it's more natural sound goes in 360 degrees no it doesn't no it doesn't when it comes out of my mouth the loudest part is right here directly in front of me <laughs> right it is right here it doesn't come out the back of my head or through my ears it doesn't do that so no yes if i took a it, 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 I'll, how about this you're if somebody's playing a trumpet is the trumpet coming direct, you know, from 360 degrees? No. Somebody hits a cymbal, is it coming from 360 degrees? No. Somebody hits a drum, is it coming from 360 degrees? No. None of these things come from 360 degrees, and yet this speaker, for some reason, does 360 degrees. I understand the sales point and what the thought process is behind it. Yes. I've never experienced a speaker that is designed this way sounding significantly better than a traditionally designed speaker where it's firing straightforward just like everything else yeah i mean it comes down to speakers should ideally just be a microphone in reverse uh most recording mics are directional there yeah. are omni omnidirectional mics but that's not typically what's being used to make a recording so right yeah. right i just <laughs> it was a yeah. it was an idea it was a theory thing it would be and if they had okay so if you took an omnidirectional mic mm -hmm. right an omnidirectional mic and absorbed the sound from all the different directions and processed it in like in such a way so that the sound that came through the back of the microphone would be reproduced out the back of the speaker and mm -hmm. that sort of thing okay but that's not the way they do it. No. <laughs> you know, it, it. It's not what's happening. In that case, you would you could still take a box and put tweeters and woofers on all sides, and then the 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 stuff in the back would only get the stuff the information that came in through the back, right. and the stuff in the front would only get the stuff that came in through the front. You know that sort of thing. But that's not the way they do it. <laughs> well, they just they record it and they record it with a directional mic and they shoot it out in three hundred six. Bose does the same thing. Sure. You know, not Bose. Well, uh, yeah, not Bose and not Bose. Bang and Olfson with their stupid things that look like uh, cigarette holders, <laughs> cigarette little things that outside the the supermarkets where you dump your cigarettes into them. You know, they have mm. a big cone thing or whatever. And I, you know, they'll they'll tell you, oh yeah, see, with fire three hundred sixty, and it makes so much. Uh, no, I don't. I don't buy it. I've never bought it. Never experienced it in such a way. But you have these speakers, so it, you're asking me if I think you should put absorption behind it. <laughs> yeah. I do. Yes. Uh, well, yeah, we, we agree with Sound Assured's advice. Yeah. Get get you some absorption on that front wall. We agree. Sidewalls, yeah. too. I'm sorry, by the way. I know that's not, that's not what you wanted to hear from me, and I apologize, <laughs> but I just, you asked my opinion, I'm going to give it to you. So JR hopes he won't sound stupid for asking, but when he reads or hears about flat, frequency, free, flat response or good acoustic measurements, what do those actually mean? Is there an app he could use to view these good measurements and learn about what these graphs look like? He's made all these changes with the bass traps and such. He can roughly compare how it sounds and make sub a subjective choice, but there's no way to do an instant A-B comparison. So there's any empirical way to measure what's going on to see if he has 
a, hit this flat response he's supposed to be aiming for, what does he need, and where would he go to learn how to use it? So a flat frequency response, first of all, you know, in an anechoic chamber, if you took a speaker and you played a sweep from the top to the bottom, 20 hertz mm -hmm. to 20 kilohertz, uh, that was the bottom to the top, but whatever. Uh, if you took that and you put that sweep in an anechoic chamber, this is a chamber that has no reflections. Okay, That's this right. is a this is a big room full of absorption, so that every every sound that comes out of that speaker is absorbed. That's right. Absorption in every that is direction, literally like twenty feet deep in yes. all sides, ceiling and floor too. The the yeah. floor is a grate above twenty feet of insulation. Yeah. Yeah. It's nuts, right? These yeah. three rooms are insane. You put the speaker in there, you run a sweep through it. When you measure the volume changes from frequency to frequency, you know, based on the amount of power you put in, it stays flat. So mm -hmm. a flat frequency response is literally a flat flat line from twenty hertz to twenty kilohertz. Yeah, now, think almost... of the think of any signal as a set of instructions, right? Set of instructions being sent to your speaker, and if you play a full sweep across all the audible frequencies from twenty hertz up to twenty thousand hertz. And that signal says, hey, play all of these sounds one after another, all at exactly the same volume. Then ideally, the speaker outputs all of those sounds at exactly the same volume, because that's what the instruction said to do. And what's the benefit of this? Well, it means that when you tell it to play anything at any volume, it should be able to give you exactly what you asked for. That's right. Okay. Not all speakers are designed this way. In fact, Many sp no speakers are actually capable of it 100%. Right. All speakers have some little inaccuracies along the way. Well, I mean, yes, because not only do you have to worry about, you know, first of all, the lowest, lowest bass requires a completely different design than, you know, dealing with the, the upper the upper end. But you have, you, you almost always, not almost always, you have to have different speakers, different drivers for yeah. different sections. So these have to cross it over into each other. And where those crossovers happen, you're going to always have some inaccuracies sure. uh, or you're fighting those with the crossover design. Then you've got driver materials that might break up or have issues with certain frequencies and not other frequencies. So we're looking for a relatively flat line. Okay. Yes. For for the use the range that we care about. So if I'm looking at a bookshelf speaker, I'm looking for a relatively flat, flat line from 20 hertz I'm sorry, 20 kilohertz down to 70, 80 hertz. Sure. If, if at all possible. 60 is often great. nice, gives you a little Six. bit of wiggle room. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, you're looking at a graph that is frequency versus volume. Right. And it should be ideally in a completely anechoic environment, a flat line going across right. because that's and what for the subwoofers was. we're looking for the same thing from you know twenty hertz or below up to around ninety or a hundred hertz mm -hmm. is what we're looking for out of a subwoofer. We want as flat as possible so that when we get give them a sound and uh, we give them an instruction, they play back the thing we want them to play back. That's why we care about it. Yeah. Now, other speaker manufacturers, some will tell you, Definitive Technology, uh, uh, Bang & Olufsen, obviously, Golden Ear. Bowles, Golden Ear, uh, they are not trying to achieve a flat frequency response. Mm -hmm. What they want is they have a target curve. Yes, Whatever BMW, they're, very highly BMW. regarded Bowers yeah. & Wilkins. Yeah, yeah. They all have a target curve that they're mm -hmm. looking for. That means that when you tell, tell it to play a, a, a 75 hertz tone through every frequency or a volume of 75 through every frequency. 75 it's decibels, sure. Decibels. Yeah. It's not going flat all the way across. There's some sort of wave mm -hmm. happening based on what they so. want. It's, That's what it's, they want. It's a design it. choice. Yeah. choice. So we say we like flat frequency response because we want what goes in to come out mm -hmm. we don't want your tone mapping or whatever you want to call it Unaltered. your uh, yeah we don't want you to tell my speakers not <laughs> to give me the thing i told to give it. it's like you don't know better than than me as far as i'm concerned uh so that's what a, a flat frequency response so the good acoustic measurements comes from being in your room and how closely you can get that yeah. within your room with all the reflections. That's what the room treatments are for. That's what the room correction is for. That's what proper placement of your subwoofers and your seats and your speakers. That's what all this is about, is trying to get, when I play a sweep from 20 hertz all the way up to 20 kilohertz, going through all these different speakers, am I getting something that resembles a flat line? 
at that's my seat. For. Yeah, at we've, your we've taken yeah. we've taken the signal has stayed the same all the time. The signal was always the same set of instructions. Play all these frequencies one after another, all at the same volume. We managed to create a speaker that gets really close to that when it's essentially not dealing with any room. It's in an anechoic chamber or in the wide outdoors at the top of a 90 foot pole and we measure it there. No reflections coming back and the speaker manages to get really close to that original signal. But now we take that speaker and put it into a room and now there are reflections and there yeah. are other sound waves happening inside this room as the sound bounces around off the surfaces and what reaches your ears is no longer a flat line um but we want to get something that looks reasonably close because again that's what the instructions in the signal said to do they said play all of these sounds at exactly the same volume why should you hear something other than all of those sounds playing at exactly the same volume that's what the instructions said to do so that's what we're looking for in a frequency response graph the other side of it is the time domain because the signal says start Start and stop, start right. and stop. And you can have an impulse that says, you know, play this sound for only 10 milliseconds and then stop. There's the speaker. Can it actually do that? And again, no speaker is perfect. Every speaker has some mass to the drivers. Those uh, drivers have some inertia, therefore. And so you're going to have some little delay in it said start, but it took a moment for it to actually start. And it said stop, especially the stop part of it. And it doesn't stop right away. It keeps moving just for a little while. That inertia is there. But we can measure that in an anechoic chamber and say, how close do we get to exactly start and stop when the impulse in the signal said to start and stop? And then we get into your room and your room is going to add reflections and there is no way to have the sound completely stop on a dime when the signal said to. In fact, unless it you would live, sound unless, really unless weird live, if it did. Unless you live in an anechoic chamber, in which case you'd walk in there and you'd be so distracted by hearing your, your heartbeat in your that's ears. Right. That, uh, and that's, just, that's not me joking. That is what you will hear. You go in the anechoic chamber, you close the door. It is that's so right. quiet in there. You can hear your blood yeah pulsing through your veins there's nothing else going on in there but um what we're hoping to see so we we can have two other types of graphs one is called a waterfall graph and mm -hmm. along the top of the waterfall graph is your frequency response hopefully something pretty close to a flat line but then it's a three axis graph so it comes coming, towards you coming toward you on the z-axis is time and so we're going to see over time that frequency response should get lower and lower and lower in volume because the signal said stop, but it takes a little moment for the sound to actually decay. But we want all the frequencies from bottom to the top to decay at a pretty uniform rate. We will always expect the low frequencies, the bass, to decay slower than the very right. high frequencies. That is just going to happen in any type of room that has some reflections. But we don't want to see like this one frequency takes way longer to decay than all other frequencies. We want a pretty uniform look to this. It looks kind of like a mountain coming towards you mm -hmm. in the waterfall graph. You can also have an impulse response decay time chart that just puts it like a square wave to show you this is the amount of time it takes for this particular frequency to decay I think the wall of however much you is set. pretty it's pretty visually it, visually it makes a lot of sense it's more useful yeah, yeah. Uh, so one thing i want to point you to is um there is a good video that's all about what sound does in small rooms i like that video very much so it's it's if you're searching for it on youtube it's called hearing is believing the ultimate small mixing and mastering room uh again i'll mention it's on a guy's channel where i don't particularly care for the fellow himself but it's very good information. I don't mind at all. It's not actually him delivering it. Um, but they show you and explain <laughs> these three types of graphs. So it's it's useful in that way as well. You can see the graphs. You can see how those graphs changed depending on what they did to the room, acoustic treatment-wise, which is exactly the sort of instruction that you're looking for. So we'll have a link for that in the show notes, but you can also just search for it. If you search for ultimate small mixing and mastering room, it'll definitely come up on YouTube for you. Um, what you need to take those kind of measurements. I mean, there are apps uh, on phones that do it, but they're not very accurate. I don't, yeah. I, I think they would actually confuse you more than help because yeah. you're not seeing accurate results. So go to a company called Cross Spectrum Labs that we recommend all the time. They sell microphones. It's $105 for a USB microphone that is stupidly accurate for $105. Uh, so it's called a U-Mic 1, U-M-I-K 1. But get the one from Cross Spectrum Labs because yeah. they have 
individually calibrated the microphone they sell you not batch calibrated not right. manufactured it to a good tolerance no individually each microphone they sell has been calibrated that's why so the way cross spectrum the way that works is is uh it, it, he's going to tell you a program to get right and yes. I, I won't spoil that so you're when you get this program you could say it'll say oh what microphone are you using you say i'm using a u-mic one that's right well it, it has a calibration file with it there's some known inaccuracies within the u-mic one mm -hmm. you know sort of they know that you know the this is you know this might me it might measure a little bit low here a little bit high there something like i don't know what it is it doesn't matter but what cross spectrum labs does is he is an you know he's got professional audio gear professional measurement microphones and what yeah, he does twenty seven thousand dollar microphone right not cheap all right not a hundred dollar one he not it's like Which are also you know, sent in twice a year back to where they do the professional calibrations to make sure it is spot on to iso so, specifications so what he does is he plays a sweep or whatever through something a speaker or whatever and then he measures with that professional microphone and then he takes the you mic he's about to send to you mm -hmm. and measures that same sweep with that with the you mic in the same location and then he compares the two. Mm -hmm. Whatever the differences are, are the inaccuracies in your specific U mic one. That's right. So he sends you not only a U mic, but he sends you a little disc, and that disc will have your calibration file. So mm -hmm. when you use the program that Rob's gonna tell you about, you will load up your specific calibration file, and you have essentially as accurate as you can get toward to a thirty thousand dollar microphone <laughs> right. for a hundred and five dollars how much do you might normally cost about a hundred bucks so yeah. you spent five dollars on this <laughs> that's if that's right. not worth five if you can't see the value from a normal <laughs> microphone to a microphone that's calibrated thirty thousand dollars mike with for five bucks then you don't understand money sure that's right that's why it's the easiest recommendation that we give out here yeah for it's, it's something quite that, quite that, simply the easiest cost, yes costs a little more we, we can't tell you it costs zero dollars true more, but that is so little for the value that you're getting and yes the program that you're going to want to use is called room eq wizard which is free so you yeah. really can't complain about that you will need a computer the, laptop yeah you, would be you do need a computer the or a uh, really the, long <laughs> really long usb cord <laughs> the, the you well even then uh, pressing things to actually play the thing and going back and forth and moving the mic but yes uh, the umic one is a usb microphone plugs into a computer room eq wizard of course is software that runs on your computer so yes uh but we're assuming that you sent this email and have access to a computer so um yeah, th that's really all you need. Now, where are you going to learn? I mean, I don't know everything about Rumi Q Wizard. The program is enormous and can do ridiculous number of things. Uh, but if you just search for basic Rumi Q uh, Wizard tutorials on YouTube, we like the one from Geek Acoustics because it's very nicely explained. It's how right. to get started. It shows you how to take a frequency response and a waterfall graph. And those are the places to start. Mm. So... Uh, I think that gives you a really good start. The help files that are in RubyQ Wizard as well. I mean, yeah, you want you want a couple of months worth of reading. <laughs> it's it's there. It is yeah. all explained. They have uh, you know whole help sections and that. But that'll absolutely get you started, and um, I think you'll have some fun. Yeah. So I mean, and it, this is what we've described is you getting uh, understanding how it sounds at your seat. That's we right. have not then described the next section the next part which is then measuring from seat to seat mm -hmm. and seeing how before calibration before you before using your room uh your room corrections system going seat to seat and measuring the same uh the same sweep and seeing how similar those graphs are what we want yes. in a room is from seat to seat and by seat we mean about two feet apart from you know yeah. two feet to either side Think like a three-seater couch maximum yeah. yeah you want you know those seats to all have uniform graph that doesn't mean they're flat that means they're uniform because when you first measure with your mic with your mic one and your room acute wizard before you run room correction you should not have a flat frequency response i mean it's just almost impossible it can happen yeah. but it's your almost room impossible. has affected what's coming out right. of the speakers yeah so but if it's uniform from seat to seat when you run your room correction you're then going to take and it's going to correct for some of your room inaccuracies. And mm -hmm. if, as long as those are the same from seat to seat, it can balance those out and have it be a much flatter 
more uniform response from seat to seat, meaning that no matter where you sit on your couch, you are experiencing a similar sound, if yeah. not exactly the same. Yeah, I get that. The instructions never change. So why right. should the person sitting to your left and the person sitting to your right be hearing something different from you sitting in the middle? The instructions from the signal were the same for all three of you, and that's what we're trying to achieve. Nice, accurate response in both frequency and time and uniformity for all the listeners within a reasonable area. You can't expect literally every spot in the room to work because rooms have reflections and we can't that's fix right. it everywhere. Yep. Yeah, some good questions there. I sorry think so. about Sorry about your speakers. All right, let's uh, end the podcast there. We want to Absolutely. thank our listeners of the week. Uh, we want to thank uh, Ezekiel for going to avrant.com and clicking on the mm -hmm. Buy Us a Cup of Coffee link, including our and also our 106 patrons over at patreon.com, including Dan. So thank you, Ezekiel, and thank you, Dan, and our 105 additional patrons. Yeah, Ezekiel, thanks so much for the PayPal donation. Dan, thanks for being for one of our 106 Patreon subscribers over at patreon.com slash avrantpodcast if you'd like to sign up. We'd also like to thank Victor for talking us up to Blue Jeans Cable, Andrew for uh, providing the models for our 100th uh, Patreon draw, as well as talking us up to Denon, NVIDIA, LG Canada, SBS, and uh, that looks like it. So thank you very much, uh, Victor and Andrew, multiple times. For sure, Victor and Andrew, thank you so much for the support. I will just mention we have people left on our list, including Brian F., Rob G., uh, Ken B., J, A, and was there one more or two more? Because Jay's question is very, very long. Uh, Joe T., uh, yep, that was it. You and guys I guess are on the list. Rob wanted to mention Joey Esposito uh, again That's for right. yeah. his comics. So check out Joey. Uh, even though you weren't a listener a week, we'll send you some love anyways. But he did absolutely help out because he was the first person where I noticed this Netflix news. I'll give a shout out to Carl too because he tipped off. But uh, yeah, I saw Joey's uh, tweet about it first. And uh, yeah, I'm a fan of his. So throw some support his way. Buy some of his comics. He deserves right. it. For AV Rant, I'm Tom Andre. And I'm Rob H. Now go out and listen to something. Want your question answered? Send it to question at avrant.com. A.V. Rant. Now go out and listen to something.